to remain safe and healthy. We are continuing to conduct our meeting virtually due to the continued state of emergency of COVID-19. You can view our meeting um, live stream on the website. You can go to MCBS TV. We will be conducting essential business of the board today, but we do have phone lines that are open. So please feel free to call in. You will be muted to put out the background noise. So at this time, I'm going to call roll, just to acknowledge that we have a quorum here today. And I will begin with Vice President Wolf. Here. Mr. Asante. Here. Ms. Dixon. She's here. She's muted. Okay. We, want to, we want to hear your voice. Yes. That's okay. I, I mute myself. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, good to see you. Um, Dr. Daka. I'm here. Mrs. O'Neill. Here. Ms. Sebestre. Here. Mrs. Smondrowski. Good afternoon. I'm here. Very good. And we also have on the line Dr. Smith, Dr. McKnight, and other senior leadership. So what I will do is I will call on um, each board member for comments, and then we'll go back around and see if board members had uh, any other comments. And I do want to just uh, let the community know that we are virtually, so we could have some Zoom technolog te technological difficulties. We may have problems with our computers. We don't know. We just want you to um, be patient with us. So at this time, I would like to get approval of the agenda. I move that the agenda be approved. Second. We moved and seconded. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. At this time, we'll move to the next item. Um, item three, human resources and development. Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, Ms. Evans and members of the board. Today we have two appointment recommendations to bring before you. Uh, the first one is um, a rather difficult one for me because it is a recommendation for a chief of staff. Uh, as many, uh, as the board all knows and the staff knows, Dr. Johnson, who's been here for the last uh, four plus years, uh, working as a trusted advisor, confidant, colleague, and uh, he has become a good friend over the now seven years plus I've worked with him, um, will be retiring at the end of, of uh, uh, November into December. And um, we'll save our kind words for Dr. Johnson for a future board meeting when we'll all uh, talk about him and embarrass him because he doesn't like it. But it does necessitate that we recommend the appointment of a new chief of staff. And so I'm... Um, coming before you today to recommend Ms. Karen Stratman as the Chief of Staff. Uh, she's been employed by the United States Department of Education for 20 years. She's worked with many Secretaries of Education. She lives in Silver Spring and she's been actively involved in Montgomery County Public Schools as a parent over that time. During her tenure at the Department of Education, she held both senior communications and programmatic roles. Uh, most recently, she is the Director of the National Public Engagement Office, serving as lead liaison to all of the national organizations with a stake in public education. Uh, she brings uh, a wealth of experience in public education. She started her career as an English and social studies teacher, um, and after that, uh, then went into the Department of Education after some years as a teacher. She is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, she looks very much forward to uh, bringing her experiences uh, to join MCPS. And I'm pleased to recommend to you today, Ms. Karen Stratman as the Chief of Staff. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Congratulations, Ms. Stratton. Welcome. We also want today to recommend uh, to you uh, Mr. Gary Mosesman as the Director of the Division of Design and Construction for the Department of Facilities Management. 
Mr. Mosesman has been employed with Montgomery County Public Schools for four years as a facilities manager in the Division of Construction. Uh, he has been actively involved in all areas of the facilities program, and uh, we are very excited about his uh, possibility of moving into this role as if, if and as approved by the board. And Mr. Mosesman expressed his desire to support MCPS students and staff through environmentally sound design and innovative concepts in the built environments across Montgomery County Public Schools. So we recommend to you today, Mr. Gary D. Mosesman, as the Director of the Division of Design and Construction. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Congratulations, Mr. Mosesman. Black emoji. All right. Dr. Smith, I'll let you go on to recognitions. The next item. Thank you. Our first recognition, this is a, a one that we can continue to recognize and celebrate just in a different way. And I've participated over the last four years in this uh, tradition in Montgomery County Public School. And that's the walk to school day. The global COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the celebration of the walk to school day in Montgomery County. And Montgomery County has choosing to engage in distance learning at this time uh, in order to keep our students and staff uh, safe. But safe pedestrian skills are still critical for children and adults. And this is something we've taken a, an important uh, look at over the last three years, really incorporated a lot of uh, effort into our curriculum because we know that walking to school enables children to incorporate daily physical activity and also helps form healthy habits that last a lifetime. Walking to school helps reduce the amount of air pollutants emitted by vehicles. International Walk to School Day is celebrated by thousands of schools from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and more than 40 countries around the world. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education Superintendent of Schools proclaim Wednesday, October 7th, 2020, as Walk to School Day and encourage students and families to participate while walking with those with whom they reside while following social distancing guidelines and local and state public health guidance. Be it further resolved that the school system notify the public and school community of the Walk to School Day, publicize this resolution and the school system's participation through internal and external communications, encourage everyone to consider the safety of pedestrians and in particular students who are walking or riding bicycles every single day. So. Move approval. Your second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. We also have a recognition today around Maryland Family Engagement Month. More than five decades of research continues to demonstrate that family engagement is a powerful influence on student achievement and success, regardless of the race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or parent or guardian's level of education. Families, educators, and community members work together as partners, hold themselves mutually accountable, and have the knowledge, skills, and confidence to succeed at improving education for all students. Montgomery County Public Schools provides opportunities for parents and guardians to engage with the school system uh, in many different ways. Montgomery County Public Schools also connects with families through the MyMCPS parent portal uh, at, in the Montgomery County Public Schools television channel, social media and information sent home from school. Family Engagement Month provides an opportunity to raise awareness of the importance of parent guardian engagement in a child's education and create structures that influence family friendly schools to support student academic achievement, development and success. Therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools declare the month of October 2020 to be Maryland Family Engagement Month and encourage parents, guardians, students, staff, and community members to recognize the importance of the homeschool partnership to improve student learning. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. We also have a recognition to a day for the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month in the United States. 
the official theme for the observance, Increasing Access and Opportunity, celebrates America's workers with disabilities and reminds employers of the importance of inclusive hiring practices. Montgomery County Public Schools, as part of the National Disability Awareness Month, recognizes the importance of removing obstacles to employment by providing inclusive practices and policies. Montgomery County Public Schools holds the core value that each and every student matters. Outcomes should not be predictable by race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. Equity demands the elimination of all gaps in creating and maximizing future opportunities for students and staff is always necessary. MCPS provides high quality professional learning opportunities for staff members to narrow the achievement gap between students with disabilities and their non-disabled peers. The school system is also committed to partnering with families to support academic success and social and emotional well-being. Montgomery County Public Schools is committed to enhancing students' social awareness and value for diversity and differences. So therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools declare the month of October as National Disability Employment Awareness Month in Montgomery County Public Schools and encourage staff members in schools to sponsor and participate in activities in honor of this recognition. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. I thought we had one more. No? Okay. Yeah, Miss Evans. Miss Evans. Yeah, Miss Evans. Yes. Um, I wonder if I could um, just offer a recognition. Um, during this time on the passing of uh, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I do so uh, because in lots of ways, I consider her a kindred spirit and the work that she did to bring about uh, gender equality in our country, I think uh, will stand for a long, long time. And, um, she was a small lady, but really a giant, I think, in the history of the court. And if I could just recommend, there's been a lot in the newspapers and on the TV about her and um, the coming uh, battle for her seat. But one of the most wonderful things that I read, which really left me uh, wanting more, I didn't want this article to end, was a uh, article that was written by her friend, Nina Totenberg, who uh, works for NPR. And I think that everyone who read that would enjoy it very, very much. Um, I did retweet it on my Twitter account uh, at uh, Dixon underscore Jeanette, so it could be read there, but you could also Google it. Uh, as well. Uh, she writes about meeting Justice Ginsburg 48 years ago uh, in a telephone conversation. And then, um, well, I don't want to tell you too much, but I think it will be so uplifting and would make you, anyone, whoever you are, just so happy uh, to be able to read that. So uh, thank you very much, uh, you know, for indulging me and being able to just say a few words about her very special person uh, from Brooklyn and from New York and um, inspired me a lot in life. So thank you. And, and can I just follow up with, uh, from, with Ms. Dixon's comments? I would really like to see um, Justice Ginberg's name added to our school listing name. Yes, yes, definitely. We will definitely take care of that. Thank you all. And so that was a definitely a good interjection, Ms. Dixon. So appreciate that. Thank you. At this time, the next item on the agenda, item five, is public comments. This um, world that we live in now is virtual. And so we are we have suspended our public comments, but um, our community members can still continue to submit their testimony. You can submit written testimony. You can send in your audio or video. Public comments is an opportunity to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. 
board members take your comments into, cons into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue um, to address specific student or employee matters. So we encourage everyone to utilize um, the avenues of redress for your complaints. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, work sessions, and any change in our meeting start times. We have received four written testimonies for today. You may view the written testimonies in full on board docs. That's where it's posted along with all the other materials for this meeting today. And so I will briefly read the summary of the four written testimonies. Tiffany Patterson. Ms. Patterson is an MCPS ESOL teacher and parent of two MCPS students. She expresses concern about returning to some school buildings and classrooms that may not have proper air filtration. She also writes about the current teacher workload and advocates for more teacher planning time. Christina Weiser. Ms. Weiser is a parent of an MCPS student with special needs. She shares the benefits of virtual learning for her son, including socializing with peers in a mainstream environment without the risk of being exposed to the virus. Christina Jeffers. Ms. Jeffers is a parent of two MCPS students who offers several observations about her children's experiences with virtual learning. She specifically shared her, her perspective regarding the need for more teaching and professional development and technology, improved school and system communication, the reinstatement of Wednesdays as an, instru as an instructional day for middle and high school, and in coordination with efforts to develop a plan to return to school buildings. Next, we will hear from our last written testimony. Um, our last hear about our, our last written testimony is from Jessica Shevitz. Ms. Shevitz is an MCPS elementary school teacher who explains that our teachers have become experts in virtual learning and she advocates for more teacher autonomy, flexibility, and ability to be innovative in the classroom rather than striving for uniformity in the delivery of instruction. She emphasizes the importance of having teachers' voices heard in the decision making around virtual learning. We have nine videos, and some of those videos were accompanied also by written testimony, and you can see that as well on board docs. First up is Charles Thomas. Hi, I'm Charles Thomas, the dad of two MCPS students. I oppose sending any students or staff back into the buildings until at least February. I respect and share your concern for the education of young and special needs students. However, they are the ones who will likely have the hardest time wearing their masks properly and consistently throughout the day. I work as a paraeducator in an elementary school. It's my job to help the students follow the rules. We don't expect everyone to get everything perfectly throughout the day, and usually that's okay. But this is a matter of life and death. Some say that it's safe to go back because uh, students get the disease in a more mild form. But that makes them even more at risk to others because they may go to school um, without their parents even knowing that they're sick and contagious. Now this isn't March and April when we thought that the virus was spread by large droplets that go out and fall to the floor within six feet. Now we know that the virus goes out in aerosols that fill the whole room and continue to circulate for hours. All it takes is one child not wearing a mask properly or when they have their masks off for lunch and one sick child can put everyone at risk um, throughout the day. And these masks won't protect me. This might look safe, but as you can see, there are many opportunities for the virus to get around the gaps in the mask and to make me sick. Please keep the buildings closed until February or until there's a vaccine. And if you open the school to some students beforehand, give staff the choice about whether or not to return or continue doing our important work from home. And not just those with pre-existing conditions. Any of us can get sick and even the most healthy can get long-term damage to our hearts, lungs, or brains. It's no longer just the risk of death. 
10 times as many people can have long-term complications, even if healthy. And we need fit-tested N95 masks, medical-grade masks, properly fitted so that none of the virus can get in through the gaps. I have other ideas uh, in my written testimony. Please take a look and references to the facts. But I want to conclude by saying to the parents, even if you're not concerned about my safety, think about your own. What if your son or daughter get the virus at school and bring it home to you? Who will take care of your young or special needs child if you wind up in the hospital for six weeks or have a long-term disability or, God forbid, die? Thank you. Next, we will hear from Lisa Klein. Good afternoon, MCPS staff and Board of Education members. My name is Lisa Klein, and I chair the MCCPTA Safe Technology Committee. I have been in receipt of hundreds of messages regarding the Rocky Return to Learning, and I've attached 14 pages of them to my written testimony. All of them have to do with excessive screen time. It's not an overstatement to say that our kids are suffering from too much screen time. Their very interest in learning is in jeopardy. But it's not just the screens. It's the deluge of apps behind the screens that are not evidence-based and that gamify education. Fortunately, we know what to do. One year ago, Maryland law tasked MSDE to create healthy screen time guidelines. This includes screen breaks every 20 minutes to stretch, refocus, and blink. I urge you to recirculate this best practices document to teachers as soon as today. We also need books. Reading is the most tried, true, and equitable method of learning. No passwords, plugs, help desk, or blue light glasses required. When have we ever heard pediatricians warn against too much reading, like they warn about screen time? Reading also relieves stress, so if ever there were a time for books, it's now. Bring out paper and pencils. Workbooks have not been delivered universally as promised, and some are even being used with the Chromebooks so I'm not sure what the point is there. As you know, cognition and retention improve greatly when kids, all of us in fact, handwrite our notes, questions, and papers. Another solution worth exploring is outdoor classrooms. In 1918, this was a successful strategy during the Spanish flu, and now there is a lot of enthusiasm in our county for this. I spoke with greenschoolyards.org and they have assembled an emergency team of landscape designers and educators to create pro bono blueprints, especially for Title I schools, and they're offering to consult with MCPS. Finally, independent study projects. Let's turn our homes into workshops. Let kids build, write, design, create for a grade. They'd simultaneously build essential life skills, such as creativity and independence. And why not have something to show that's tangible for this unique time in history? Uh, my final note is just a few sentences that I'll share with you that I received Friday from a parent, and I thought it was especially poignant. She says about her, her sixth grader, not a day goes by that my child does not beg me to stop the computer learning. She says she feels she can recover from COVID but not from the impact of all the forced screen time. Thank you all very much. MCCPTA Safe Tech looks forward to working with you on solutions. Take care. Next, we will hear from Zena Carmel Jessup, and you also will find additional written documents um, on board docs. My name is Zena Carmel Jessup, and I'm a parent in Montgomery County, and I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about some really important things that I have been learning. All of our students are using internet way more than we ever imagined that they would be, and there are best practices for doing it safely without using the Wi-Fi. According to the New Jersey Education Association, article, Minimize Health Risks from Electronic Devices, specifically recommends using wires and cables such as this Ethernet adapter, USB to Ethernet. Totally simple, very easy. My kids do it themselves. They've been doing it for years in school as well as now at home. The New Jersey Education Association 
published in their article a list of things that people can do to help reduce the dangers of brain damage and other health risks from Wi-Fi. For example, keeping your device away from your body. This is really important. If your kids are laying in bed, they're just sitting there with a device on their body. Carrying their phones off of their body. Using all of your devices hardwired that can connect to the internet. That's where this comes in. We all used to use ethernet cords, so it's just really doing what we know, and what we know is that that is 100% safer. Um, we want to make sure that printers, projectors, and other kinds of boards are wired and plugged in. Um, Hardwired phones as opposed to cell phones. And putting your devices, um, and that can be laptops as well as cell phones, on airplane mode, which suspends the emission of EMF electromagnetic frequencies. So if you disable your Bluetooth, your GPS, etc., you are not continuously exposing your body to harmful wireless radiation. So I am calling on the Board of Education in Montgomery County to please step up and be sure that all families have this knowledge that I found um, so that they can make informed choices about connecting to the internet more safely and honestly much more reliably we never get kicked off our internet we can have multiple kids using the internet at the same time when we simply use wires and turn off the wi-fi so this is how i plug in my chromebook i simply take the ethernet cord which we're all familiar with right into this adapter simple inexpensive i plug it right into the chromebook voila it will automatically say Ethernet connection found. Next, we will hear from. Yeah, so I'm sorry. So oh. next, we will hear from Theodora Scarato. And, and additionally, she will have um, written materials um, on Vordocs as well. All the kids are on screens for hours every day, starting even with the kindergartners. And most children and their parents are using Wi-Fi in order to connect to the internet. Now, I firmly believe that every child should have access to education and every family should have connections to the internet. However, it is important that they not receive wireless radiation at the same time. Companies can fix this by providing wired internet access for all families. It does not have to be that kids are using mobile hotspots or using uh, Wi-Fi. This wireless radiation is linked in published, peer-reviewed science to a multitude of health impacts, which include DNA damage, uh, changes to reproduction, uh, impacts to the brain, and uh, of course cancer. You know, all for most of these effects, we wouldn't notice them for years and years. And right now we're talking about hours every day of exposure. I would like to ask that the board uh, take action to ensure that students have ethernet cords and that they work with the companies who are donating uh, hardware and software, that they donate safe uh, ethernet as well as ethernet adapters. Wired, non-wireless connections are faster and safer and more secure. When a child is sitting in front of an iPad or a laptop, that device is, is emitting wireless frequencies which the body is absorbing. So I understand that it might seem highly inconvenient and, and how could anyone raise this in the midst of all the changes that we're making? But actually, it's the perfect time to raise this issue because right now, when our health is so important, we need to make sure that we're taking every step. When the county looked into this years ago, they did uh, radiation measurements that compared the levels in the school to the FCC safety thresholds. However, the FCC limits are not protective, not by a long shot. 
I'm not talking 10 to 20 times. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of times too high to protect our health. There also is inaccurate information that is up on the MCPS website and it needs to be corrected. Our organization is actually in historic legal action against the FCC for having these guidelines from 1996, not changing them, and refusing to look at the latest science or to listen to scientists. There are literally hundreds of scientists who are stating that exposure needs to be reduced. Please listen to the scientists. Next, we will hear from Stacy Lynch and Margaret Bower. Hello, I am Stacy Lynch. I am Margaret Bauer. We are the Elementary Council on Teaching and Learning Co-Chairs. We want to thank the board for its hard work during this extraordinary time. We know that you have the best interest of children at the heart of your deliberations, and we appreciate your focus on the safety of those in our school system. However, we must bring to your attention the challenges that educators are facing to provide equity and access for all students. As the school year started, we realized we were working many hours beyond our duty days to meet the needs of our students. We heard the same from colleagues. So we invited elementary educators to complete a brief Google form that asked, what school do you serve? What is your grade level or position? And how many hours beyond your duty day did you work the week of September 6th? We were shocked to receive 1,552 responses from every elementary school in MCPS and even 66 responses from middle and high schools. This speaks to how much educators needed to tell their stories about wanting to meet the needs of their students and the numerous difficulties they are facing. We ask that you consider the following. 283 educators spent up to 10 additional planning hours. 590 between 10 and 20 hours, 502 between 20 and 40 hours, 93 between 40 and 90 additional hours over the course of one week. Here's some comments we received from educators, quote, many hours are spent training, teaching myself how different applications work, which will enhance engagement for my students. Quote, to be expected to teach the regular curriculum with very little modification to our youngest learners is disrespectful to us as well as to our students. We are not providing an adequate or appropriate education to them right now. Quote, the amount of kids screen time is too much at the elementary level, end quote. Some themes became apparent in the comments. Issues with technology, including the Synergy platform and the inability of county issued Chromebooks to handle the capabilities we need. Having two new curricula at most elementary schools. Adapting all the curricula into the online format, which is like translating everything into two languages in which you are not yet fluent. Lack of planning time due to meetings and troubleshooting the tech issues of our families. Sheer exhaustion as a result of the above. It is critical that all students have equal access to quality learning during physical school closure. It is also essential that the people who care for our students are also cared for. Educators are struggling to meet the needs of all students given current conditions. Educators can make virtual learning successful. We have worked hard to make the fall semester engaging for our students and families. Our educators are committed to doing the best for our students so they can be well physically and emotionally and continue to learn safely at home. However, the conditions under which we are working now are not sustainable. We look forward to working with MCPS on how to ensure that educators can meet the needs of their students during virtual learning. We know there are ways to alleviate the pressure on educators that will allow us to serve our scholars safely at home until Dr. Gales and other officials have determined that it is safe for everyone to return to school. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Byron Johns and Diego Uberu from the Black and Brown Coalition. Dear members of the Board of Education, Superintendent Smith, on behalf of the Black and Brown Coalition and those who we serve, we want to say thank you for everything you have done in order to make MCPS a more equitable system for all students. Last year, in response to the inequities shown by the ERS report and uh, in response to the realities experienced on the ground by Black, Brown and poor families in Montgomery County, the Coalition asked 
you to please pledge to support four asks. Ask number one had to do with access to rigorous courses for black, brown, and poor students. Second was uh, access to effective and diverse teachers. The other one was about access to effective and diverse leaders. And there was a fourth ask about accountability. Those asks were really crucial then, are even more important now during COVID times, and will be even more important, even more important during recovery of learning loss after COVID ends. In a letter we sent to you a few months ago, we congratulated you on all your efforts, but also asked you to please do more, to please not stay just with the efforts that we made thus far. We have to work together to continue to eliminate inequities that have been caused by decades and decades of systemic racism, which have been exacerbated by COVID. As a result of the pandemic, we have identified other areas of inequities where our black, brown, and low-income students need us to do even more. The gaps over the last six months have only widened. We need additional support for students and families that are struggling with technology. Parents that are not tech savvy need more support that is culturally competent and helps them with supporting their children during the virtual learning. We also ask you to have MCPS provide outreach proactively to students that have not been able to successfully re-engage with their schools in a way that virtual learning benefits them. We also ask in the area of food distribution, we would encourage MCPS to continue to look at expanding the number of sites and the hours in which food can be distributed to families in need. Parents cannot leave during the course of the middle of their workday in all cases to seek the meals, provide the meals for their children. Lastly, recovery of learning loss has got to be a priority for black, brown, and low-income children. The coalition working with private partners have been able to stand up the first educational equity and enrichment hub at an elementary school in Montgomery Village starting September 14th. We encourage you to work with us to expand access throughout the county as this is a vital need for many families that have been highly impacted by the virus. And lastly, we look forward to seeing you at our Coalition Virtual Accountability Forum, October 15th at 7 p.m., where we will follow up on the pledges made a year ago. And we will take a look at where we've made progress and also where there is work still to be done. We thank you for all that you've done and look forward to seeing you at that event. Thank, thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Kevin Daughtery. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Doherty. Thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak to you again. I've submitted testimony at the last few board meetings trying to articulate how safe it is for our children to return to school and how the board needs to be focusing on safety precautions for the teachers. The data is all out there and it's still out there and it's all out there for you guys to consume. So I'm not going to do a deep dive into that. Instead, I want to tell you about my son. In previous testimonies, I've told you I have two children. I have a third grader and a fifth grader. My son is in fifth grade, and in many ways, he's your typical 10-year-old fifth grade boy. He loves to play Fortnite, probably a little bit too much. He loves WWE guys. He loves baseball. His heroes are Juan Soto and Victor Robles of the Washington Nationals. He loves to do um, puppets. He is Jim Henson, and the Muppets are his favorite, and he's gotten very, very good at ventriloquism. He's a wonderful, kind, loving boy, and he's the apple of my eye. 
I love him with all my heart, and I couldn't be more proud to be his dad. But over the course of the summer, I didn't have my son. And I'm going to tell you a story. He, I knocked on his door the other day, um, and I came in, and he was sitting on his bed, and he had two WWE action figures in his hands. Uh, he had Stone Cold here, and he had The Rock here, um, but he wasn't even doing anything with them. He was just holding them. His WWE ring was right next to there, but he, they were just in his hands, and he was looking off into the distance. Uh, and I asked if I could play WWE with him, and he kind of said no. Uh, I asked if he wanted to go for a bike ride, and he shrugged his shoulders. I asked if he wanted to go through the football round in the backyard, and he said no thanks. He just wanted to be in his room. So respectfully, I left. And I stood outside his door for a few minutes, um, and I knew something was wrong. So I knocked again, and I came in, um, and he was there just standing, staring off into the distance, a thousand yard stare into the wall, not doing anything. And I talked to him, and he started to tear up and get upset. And I don't even think he knew if he was crying or not, uh, but he talked about how he misses his friends and how he misses his teachers and how he just doesn't know what's going on. And I tried to explain to him that his feelings are fine and it's normal and that these are exceptional times, but it breaks my heart. And I know everybody here on this board probably hears that story or hears stories similar to it. And it hits you here because you're good people and clearly you care about children. Otherwise you wouldn't be on the board of education. And you're probably thinking it's sad that Corona has done this or it's sad that Donald Trump has done this to this boy, but Corona didn't do this to him because we know he's safe from Corona. It's you that did this to him. It's your decisions to keep us in this entirely virtual scenario that's doing this to him. We know he's safe. He can see his friends. He can see his teachers. If you had the courage to, to let it happen, if you found the intestinal fortitude to stand up to those social media warriors or those fear mongers that are out there, if you had the courage to stand up to those people, they could be in school right now. And he wouldn't be showing these signs of depression. He wouldn't be crying in his room. If you had the courage to do that, what was right? So I hope today that when you spend your hour and a half talking about return to school, it's not two hours of congratulating each other, of thanking each other for a job well done, because let's be clear, this is not a job well done. This is a job very poorly done. And each and every single one of you needs to find the courage to say, no, this is wrong. We are failing our children. We are asking our children to carry the entirety of this burden, and it is not right. There should be no more talk about how to enable virtual learning. There should be no more talk about how to get meals to kids. It should all be talk about how to get teachers back in the classroom. You have a responsibility. You wanted this leadership position, so lead. Get them the masks, get them the face shields, get the desk guards, get the hand sanitizers, and get them back in the classroom. The risk to the children right now is far greater in our virtual learning environment than any threat or risk of COVID. Please, Find it within yourself to have the courage to do the right thing. Next, we will hear from Tammany Kramer. Thank you, board members. My name is Tammany Kramer, and my daughter started at Eastern Middle School this fall. Virtual learning should be continued. Cases are down in our county because schools are closed. It's like someone said, Reopening schools during a pandemic is like throwing your umbrella away during a rainstorm because after all, you haven't gotten wet. The physical environment of our schools does not yet allow for safe reopening. Many schools, including my daughters, are very overcrowded. They lack proper ventilation. They do not have adequate HVAC systems, including the filtration level needed for safety during a pandemic. The number of bathrooms, even if you rotate subgroups of students through. The number of bathrooms is not sufficient. Buses do not allow for safe distancing. If you've ever ridden a school bus, you will realize this. Um, a big hurdle is the thorough and adequate sanitizing of the surfaces uh, on a daily basis uh, to keep everybody safe. Secondly, behavioral considerations. It is not realistic to expect students to be able to adequately comply 
with masking and distancing and other hygiene measures. I know when my daughter has a friend over and they are social distancing outside, despite their best intentions and many reminders from me, they still will creep closer together, the masks will slide off and so forth. If you go out into our community, you see many adults are having trouble following best practices with masking and distancing and so forth. How can we possibly expect students to do better than our adults? We don't yet know the long-term effects of COVID. We're still learning about how it's transmitted, who it affects and how it affects them. We do know that COVID affects different population groups differently. And there are issues with regard to how large the county is because different zip codes have different COVID rates. One size does not fit all, but unfortunately the county is large and that's what we're dealing with. A hybrid model doesn't work because virtual students need dedicated synchronous instruction. Teachers cannot possibly do justice if dealing with two populations simultaneously, virtual and in class. What should happen is more resources should go into supporting the virtual learning, giving the teachers the tech and other things they need, supporting families, including those with younger students so that they can navigate the system adequately. Of course, we would like to be back in school. Of course, my daughter would love to be there with friends and classmates. We're not there yet, and we should continue virtual learning until it is safe to be back in person. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for your service. Our final video will come from David King. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith, Dr. McKnight, Board President Evans, and members of the Board of Education. My name is David King, and I'm a senior at Walter Johnson High School. Some of you may remember me from the last time I spoke here, where I talked about the ways in which I believe our grading system for virtual learning was unfair. Since then, you've created policies to restrict the number of assignments that students can give and created new rules for categorization, and I want to commend you for taking those actions. But with all due respect, you still haven't gone far enough. I feel betrayed to sit here at home while principals from all over the county sit there and tell you how well virtual learning is going. It's not going well. Our grading system was created to evaluate what was supposed to be a normal learning system. This is barely a learning system at all. I'm aware that you made a difficult decision with your hands tied, and I'm not saying that I think it's reasonable to expect that your system could fundamentally change at this point. But students only have two hours a week in our classes, and we're being graded on the material that in a normal year we would spend twice as much time learning. Online learning has its drawbacks, we knew that was going to happen. But even the problems with the simplest solutions are going completely unaddressed. Finding assignments on Canvas is sometimes a complete scavenger hunt, and even though it would be very easy to standardize the organization across MCPS, only a handful of schools have done that so far. Teachers are often inaccessible during their Wednesday office hours, which already only happen for 20 minutes once a week. Students used to be able to meet with their teachers for longer than that, three different times a day when they needed to go in for extra help. This obviously isn't their fault, but it's also not something we should be punishing students for. Expectations differ wildly from class to class, New policies are completely unknown from students and teachers alike, and it's not uncommon for an entire class to go days without having any clue what is going on. In addition, a lot of classes don't adapt well to an online format. Hour-long lectures are almost impossible to listen to, a lab class has no chance in taking place in your own home, and musical or artistic classes are completely out the window. All in all, whether or not this was the best possible system we could have come up with, it certainly doesn't provide anything approaching a normal learning experience. By the time you're seeing this, MAP testing will have already begun, but I don't expect that you'll get any actual meaningful data out of that. Some students will cheat, others won't try, in general it's not going to be an effective standardized test. Look instead at the metrics that you can garner some data from. Interims are coming up. How much are grades differing from other years? What students are being left behind? Are we truly addressing the problems that matter right now, such as providing mental health and other necessary resources to students, or are we merely covering our ears and pretending like everything is normal? Only by addressing these questions and by allowing students and staff to have a far greater voice in explaining their concerns with the system can we really come up with an answer. Right now students are not learning the content, they're not getting the help that they need, and they're not able to keep up the rigors of a traditional grading system in a completely non-traditional setting. Online school is obviously a flawed system with many long-term implications, but this problem is the most addressable one you face today. I implore you to reevaluate and alter our system here. We need a system that focuses on student learning and interaction with a massive emphasis on students' well-being, and not another system that allows you to pretend that our hastily constructed online learning model 
is even remotely close to a viable alternative to traditional instruction. Thank you for your time. The health of all of our students rests in your hands. This concludes public comments. I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of our community members and including our students and our teachers for coming to give um, their testimony. The board will take all of your comments into consideration. Um, I, I, um, I'll get to Mrs. Madrowski in just a second. Just wanted everyone to know that our next scheduled board meeting will be on October the 6th. That is a Tuesday. Public comments will open up on Wednesday, September the 30th. If there are any board members that have any comments in reference to the testimony that we just heard, whether audio or video or written, um, we'll open that up. I just wanted to also thank our staff for the work, our board staff, the work that they do to prepare um, all of the testimony and to MTPS TV. Mrs. Smodrowski. Yeah, thank you. I too just want to thank all of our. Um, our people who came and testified to, or who testified today. Um, I especially want to thank our student for um, his testimony and sharing his feedback with us. Um, I think it's really important that we do hear from our students as well. Um, I had a couple of little things, um, and I'm not sure if it's now is the right time or during the um, opening of schools and recovery of education update, but I'm going to do it now because two, there were two items that were touched upon during public comments. Um, the first one was um, from the teachers and talking about the surveys. And I know we've all received some emails and some concerns um, about um, some of the questions that perhaps should have been included on the survey. I haven't seen the survey, so I don't know if it's possible for us to do that. You may have sent us a link and I missed it. But, um, but I also know that much like the uh, teachers who gave testimony today, there are other um, people who've put out individual surveys. And I'm wondering if it's possible that we forward those on to MCPS or that they forward them on to MCPS to be taken into consideration as well. Absolutely, we, we look at anything that we receive. So please, if, if you have them or if someone else has them, please have them send them to uh, MCPS. Okay, thanks, because I know some things were done on Facebook. Um, and then the, the last th um, thing that I wanted to mention was about the some of the concerns with the technology. Um, I have been looking into um, blue light glasses um, and the effectiveness of them. My daughter has them and she says that they are lifesavers in terms of her being on her computer doing all that work. Um, I ordered some online to try them out. Um, and I've had conversations with council member Andrew Friedson um, and some others. Um, I've been looking into um, finding, potentially finding a private investor who might want to sponsor these, purchasing these for our students. Um, I have, uh, like I said, done some research and I've gotten an amount, um, a rough amount on what it would cost for retail. Um, but myself and um, someone who was interning with me this summer, um, have reached out to some of the companies that make them to see if we could get them at a you know more wholesale price. Um, so I just I'm mentioning it to you because I will share with you those the costs and stuff. Um, I don't know if it's something you want to have conversations with with the council about. Um, I know that a lot of the information seems new and so maybe not conclusive. I don't know, but I just thought in terms of. I do have concerns about how much the screen time and, and how much we're hearing from parents um, and teachers about their concerns with screen time. So it just might be a little something that we could look into doing to help provide um, one measure of um, safety for headaches, blurry visions. Um, there's a long list of potential concerns that the, the blue light glasses are you know, supposedly help with. So I'll forward you that information I just wanted to to mention to you that um, Councilmember Preetson and I have had multiple conversations about it and it might be something worth looking into. So thank you. Um, at this time, what we'll do is we'll move on to the next item of the agenda, item six, action on board policy, Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, all right, thank you. Um, so on May, May 6th, uh, 2020, the US Department of Education promulgated new regulations regarding sexual harassment. Um, 
it, it, the new regulations c govern reporting, investigation, and discipline of students um, of sexual harassment, which is a form of sexual discrimination under Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Um, the regulations uh, set forth apply not only to higher education institutions which receive public funding, and I might add that there has been a lot of publicity around the regulations re related to higher education institutions, but they also apply to K-12 institutions who receive federal funding. Um, upon the issuance of these regulations, which took effect August 14th, 2020, um, MCPS staff began immediately evaluating the implications of the revisions to Title IX. The, off, the following offices have been involved in this effort, Student Welfare Compliance Unit, the Office of Employee Engagement and Labor Relations, and the Office of the General Counsel and the Chief of Staff of MCPS. They have updated our training and other um, it, regulations in the system, but our policy needs to be in compliance. We've taken all the necessary steps um, immediately, but we need to temporarily suspend our policy, ACF, on sexual harassment until we, the policy committee, can revise the actual language. Um, but I want to emphasize that everything is in, will, is in compliance and the summer compliance training for our employees in this arena were um, updated. So we have been doing everything, but we need to revise the policy. This policy and uh, the Title IX pertains to all of our playgrounds, our classrooms, our playing fields, and our workplaces. It is a very important policy. So with that said, I'm going to offer um, a motion on behalf of the policy committee to temporarily suspend ACF while we work to actually dot all our I's and cross all our T's in the policy itself. So I will read to you the following resolution. Whereas 20 USC 1681 authorizes and directs school districts receiving federal financial assistance to effectuate Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 as amended and whereas on May 6, 2020, the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights published the final rule uh, amending Title IX regulations of 34 CE, CFR Part 106, and whereas the amended Title IX regulations were effective as of August 14, 2020, and whereas the Montgomery County Board of Education has previously adopted um, prohibitions against discrimination on the basis of sex in MCPS programs or activities as set forth in policy, ECA, non-discrimination, equity, and cultural pro proficiency, policy ACF, sexual harassment, and policy JHF, bullying, harassment, or intimidation. And whereas the Chief of Staff of Montgomery County Public Schools oversees the Title IX, serves as the Title IX coordinator in the Student Welfare and Compliance Unit, unit who coordinates compliance with state and federal regulations re regarding discrimination on the basis of sex, and whereas the MCPS non-discrimination st statement meets federal requirements to publicize the contact information for the Title IX coordinator of all major MCPS publications, 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby implements all aspects of the federal Title IX res regulations, including, but not limited to, updated definitions of sexual harassment, equal treatment in re responding to complaints of sexual harassment, including notices to all parties as required and objective in an objective grievance process and be it further resolved that the Board of Education will temporarily suspend policy ACF sexual harassment and authorizes the superintendent of schools to establish required procedures while the board's policy management committee revises policy ACF to align with the requirements of the new federal regulations. Um, so I offer that on behalf of the policy committee. I, I think uh, Ms. Dixon is going to second it, but it actually we don't since it's coming from the committee, it doesn't really necessarily require a second. Can you hear me? Okay. So are we going to have discussion with Ms. Williams? Yes. Um, Ms. Ms. Williams from the Office of the General Counsel is available for uh, any questions or discussion. As, as is Mr. Greg Edmondson, the Director of Student Welfare and Compliance. Just wanted to recognize his participation. Ms. Wolf, you wanted to make a comment? No comment. I just have a question. I think it's procedural. Um, when you suspend the policy, did you say, <clears throat> excuse me, did you say that the federal policy is in effect for the county pending you issuing new policy? Is that what you said? Yes. They, we have met the uh, letter of the regulations. Uh, yeah. The updated training this summer and the compliance training was done. It's the we've met it all to be in compliance with that August 14th deadline. But our Don't policy is to not. Know if we, ask, we have a policy in place pending. We have we have the old policy. That's what we're suspending, even though we've already done what has has to be done. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any questions from board members before we take a vote? Yes, I, I have a question. Uh, so uh, I think I have missed uh, a piece here, but is this a normal procedure? Uh, I don't remember us suspending a policy while we update that policy, what, why would we do that uh, if we're in compliance? Um, because our policy language, I mean, obviously this is gonna have to be fast tracked. Our policy language is not in agreement with all of the specifics of the fed, new federal requirements. And, you know, anyone receiving federal funds has to I mean, obviously, federal law, federal regulations trump state law, which trump any of our policies. Ms. Williams, did you want to speak or say anything? Yeah, well, just a little further, in addition to Mrs. O'Neill's comments in response to Mrs. Dixon, um, the language in the current policy, specifically the definition of sexual harassment um, and certain other compliance measures are, are, are not in compliance with the new law. Um, and you are correct that we have not taken this uh, approach before. Um, quite frankly, we were trying to do, uh, considering um, an, an expedited non-substantive uh, revision of the policy, um, which would have been choppy at best, um, but would have been in place. And we learned um, through, through the, uh, you I'm sure are, are familiar with the Council of Sc School Attorneys, we uh, share information that other districts um, were taking this approach because given the very quick turnaround time from the uh, uh, implementation date in May to the effective date in August to be able to get the training and the, and the materials and so forth updated, as well as have the necessary time for the policy committee to consider the revised language 
and public comment and all of that um, in, the, in that May to August window. Um, it's quite challenging. So um, in, in, in uh, hearing from strategies being taken by other districts across the country that were going um, this route, we thought we would give this a try um, this time, the circumstances um, were warranted. So this, re this resolution essentially says that the, that the board affirms and the district's intent to comply with all of the requirements of the new regulation. And it sets out much of the compliance requirements because it says that we have a Title IX coordinator, we have policies in place, ACF, uh, the non-discrimination policy, as well as our bullying policy that prohibit um, sexual harassment. We have, we have identified um, a Title IX coordinator, that's um, Mr. Edmondson in the uh, director, uh, the director of Student Welfare and Compliance Unit. We have notified the community through our non-discrimination statement that is a part of each one of our um, handbooks and there is a web page, a page on our website dedicated to it. So we have met the elements of the law um, and, and Mr. Edmondson's team is prepared um, with all necessary materials to respond to any such complaints that arise um, in accordance with the law. So we have put those, those foundational building blocks in place to meet the law. It's the policy itself um, that needs to be revised and we needed um, the, uh, more time than from May to August, particularly given this May to August uh, to get that in place. This is too important a policy to have just done it as a technical amendment, which, you know, on some things as new, uh, you know, as Comar comes down, we've done technical amendments. We have not taken this approach of suspending a policy, but it requires us to do a thorough job. It's a very important policy as far as I'm concerned, and especially in light, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a champion of women's rights, you know, uh, prior to, you know, as the general, as general counsel at the ACLU, you know, uh, discrimination is a piece of the of sexual harassment. So we've, this is the approach that uh, we had settled upon uh, in meeting with staff to bring it forward, to do it this way, to do a thorough job with the policy revisions and not just make it a, a cut and paste with the, um, you know, technical amendments. And we are actively engaged in, in redrafting um, the, the policy to be in alignment with Title IX. So it will be coming forward um, very, very soon. Okay, I don't, uh, you know, uh, I don't have strong feelings about it, but I just, you know, was trying to understand why, you know, if we have all of the pieces in place, uh, we couldn't take the time that we need and and move forward. Um, you know, I would hate to see us uh, in the future um, suspending policies while we're working on updating them. Uh, you know, I, so that's fine. If uh, you want to do that, uh, I'll vote for it. But um, uh, I would caution that in the future, yeah. um, that would not be a practice that, uh, you know, it's, I would employ. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, so, some of the regulations that were up, I mean, the definition, it, it's not, appear and symbol, just little technical amendments. I mean, it is, uh, I mean, some, the very um, important issues related to um, investigating, reporting, training, and, and the very definition of sexual harassment warrant a uh, more thorough um, active discussion among board members as we bring forward a new policy and also for out for public comment. It's, it's not a yeah. practice that I believe should be replicated. 
I right. mean, there are, you know, our policy on policy setting does say in exigent circumstances, we may right. temporarily suspend part or all of a policy. And we did use that in the spring for the first time ever. This is an unusual process for revisions to a policy, but it is also somewhat due to COVID, but also to the short time frame right. from the issuance of the regulation from the Department of Education to when it took effect. Right. Well, it might be useful, Pat, also to maybe write a letter to the Department of Education to let them know that, you know, two months is uh, not enough time to, you know, revise policies and things like that, that, uh, you know, just what we had to do in order to be in compliance. Uh, I, I think I would, it would just be helpful to let them know that. I, you know, I have no problem with that. I, I think uh, some in high, there's been much discussion in the press about the implications at the higher ed level, not with the timing, but with the issuance of the revised regulations. Mm -hmm. That's, but for us, our purposes, it's really, you know, with the time frame. All right. So let's call okay. the vote. Ready to call the vote? All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you so much, Mrs. O'Neill. At this time, we move to item seven of the agenda. I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Smith or Dr. Gonna... Yes, thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, we're once again here to talk about uh, where we are as we uh, try to meet the needs of all of our students as best we can. Uh, I'm going to say a couple of things that are incredibly obvious, but I'm going to say them anyway because I think that we always have to remind one another, no one would choose this. No one did choose this situation. It has been thrust upon all of us. And uh, so when we talk about it, we're not talking about something in glowing terms that we think is good. And if we just work hard enough, we can perfect it. And I'm not talking about virtual learning. I'm not talking about opening schools or keeping school buildings or keeping school buildings closed. I'm talking about all of it. All of us right now, this minute are separated, even though we have spent literally thousands of hours together over the last several years since I've been here as a board and as staff working together and all of a sudden we're separated most of the time or at least we're only in very small groups working together when we do work together and every single aspect of the public education system has been has been looked at we've had to look at it change it adjust it stop doing it start doing other things everything every single thing the way we do it has had to change and so as we work through this, we're on day 16 of 182 day school year this year, and we'll keep working through it because we can continue to make it better. But making it better does not imply that we make it preferable or something we would want to keep being separated. And if we just simply took the public comments today and created a YouTube video out of them and put them up, what you see are drastically different interests, perspectives, opinions, beliefs, attitudes about everything. And so I will continue to push that we work together, that we be willing to change, that we be nimble and flexible, that we listen to other people's opinions, that we just all work hard together. And uh, the board um, members have just been really truly uh, terrific and incredible in working through this. I know this has been an incredibly difficult situation for you. I know you've gotten literally tens of thousands of emails in six months and from all those same perspectives. So on September 10th, we shared with you uh, uh, a lot of information about where we were. Uh, principals and teachers came in and shared with you no one was saying that they preferred this or that they would choose this over the way we all know school can be. What we were saying is we're going to keep working on it. We're going to keep working together until we can have students fully engaged with one another in physical spaces again. 
What I do want to push on us to do is think about our practices, our policies that we were just discussing, our regulations and ways of doing business, all of those things that we do and anywhere that we can along the way identify things that we've learned during this that make us better at serving the needs, the well-being, the learning of students and, and the needs of families, we should keep and adopt forever. And things we identify as, as layers are stripped away that are barriers to students or that are difficult for students or that we shouldn't be doing that way because we're in this circumstance of examining everything we should stop doing them. We should have the courage to say we're not doing that anymore because during the pandemic and the closure of school facilities, because school is not closed, just the facilities are closed, then we should have the courage to say we're never going to go back to doing that because it didn't work for students before COVID-19. And so really want to push on everybody. We just have to keep thinking about what's working, what's not working and how to make it better in this very unusual circumstance that none of us have experienced before, because none of us in this conversation we're having right now were alive in 1918, which is kind of the closest thing to this with the worldwide pandemic of, of Spanish flu, where they estimated that more than 50 million people died in those uh, year and a half or so. So today we're gonna talk about What's been the impact on student learning in this pandemic situation of school building closures? We don't know the answer to that, but we're looking for ways to better understand it and, and respond to it. How will we know what that impact is and what do we need to do in the next 166 days to fully meet the needs of our students to the degree that we can until we can be in physical spaces? And that's not code for saying that we're gonna be closed longer or shorter. Because one of the things that happen is every time we talk about small groups of students or second semester, people say, well, you can't open schools today. Well, we're not going to open schools today. Some other people say, well, you can't open schools at all, not till there's a vaccine. At some point, schools have to open. We've got to begin to find some middle ground in this conversation. Today is not possible, never is unacceptable and we've got to find a way to talk about it. So the staff is prepared today to talk through some of the issues. We want to give you some of the metrics that we've learned over the last few weeks about our enrollment, our attendance, our engagement, and how we're responding to that. So we're going to actually answer some of the questions that were posed in the public comment today in our presentation, uh, and we want to give you that information. I will tell you that I just happened to get a little while ago, the list I asked for are on enrollment. And so as a precursor to the enrollment section, it appears from my quick review of it, that all of our elementary schools are, uh, none of them met 100% of their projection. So in other words, they might be 1% lower in enrollment than we expected, or they might be 10% lower in enrollment, but all of them are under the enrollment that we expected in those schools this year, all of the elementary schools. It also appears that our high schools came in very close to their projection, most of them slightly under, some of them uh, slightly over. Interestingly enough, and I love to look at data and numbers and think why it happens that way, it would appear that all of our middle schools met their enrollment projections or are slightly over them by one or 2%, not significantly. So just something to think about as we look at lots of numbers, uh, how that works. But we do know that we have uh, significantly fewer students this year than we expected to have, and we actually have fewer than we had last year. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. McKnight, and we'll walk through this, and there are built-in places for discussion so that we don't go too long in any one set before we give you a chance to uh, respond and react and ask questions and make comments and offer solutions. So, Dr. McKnight? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, board members. As Dr. Smith uh, just stated for you, we are learning, we'll continue to learn and continue to have conversations about what we can do to build on what our staff, our school-based staff and our central office staff are telling us about what's working and what we wanna take into the future after COVID-19 while we are simultaneously right now taking that feedback 
and thinking about ways that we can build on it to support our virtual environment currently, while we are also at the same time planning and preparing for when we are safely able to bring students back into the building. And so today I just wanna elevate that because as we continue to get feedback from our uh, teachers, our leaders, our community stakeholders, and we embrace this whole recovery plan, it does continue to require a shift in our thinking and how we approach our work, which we continue to be open to. Um, I'll speak specifically about the fact that our cross office planning teams continue to work in collaboration with our school-based staff to think about ways that we can continue to support instructional staff who are providing learning to our students, supporting services staff, our leaders, all in think about ways to better navigate our virtual environment while also again facilitating and learning from and planning for what it will look like as we transition students back into the building when it's safe to do so. So we constantly work on these two tracks as we learn and solicit, take the feedback and apply it immediately and to the future. Um, and I'll say while our opening of school this year has been very different in a number of different ways, in which Dr. Smith mentioned, we continue to reconcile what are the things that we would normally be doing in, during this time of year that we need to translate into the virtual environment. And a big part of that is always assessing where our students are when they return to school after the summer months, because whether we were in COVID-19 or not, this is a time in which we would be assessing what is the learning loss that may have taken place for our students who've been out for summer what have been the supports that we put in place during summer that could have supported our students? And ultimately, how does that inform the instruction that we need to provide for them now? And so we are very much still in that place as we think about administering assessments to our students and determining what are gonna be the starting points for our instruction based on what we find out as we evaluate the what the losses and gains have been now that we have been in a virtual environment since the spring. So I believe in order for us to continue to recognize that the school opening is like no other that we've ever experienced, we've got to continue to think about the current state of our students' academic and social emotional well-being and attend to that now. So the data that we gain not only informs classroom instruction, but it also informs the support that we think we need at the uh, district and state level so that we can continue to advocate for those supports and plan for those supports and make them meaningful right now and in the future. We also know that a result of virtual learning um, that did begin in March, some of the data that we historically have been able to access and implement in certain ways, it's not one, some of it's not available to us, but we also have to put that into the context of our students are in a virtual environment. And so how do we take into account how these diagnostics will be administered, how we utilize them, what they tell us, and what may be some uh, things that we need to consider knowing that they've tested in a different environment than normally they would in a brick and mortar setting. So we're gonna talk about that today and why those diagnostic pieces are really important and how we're gonna be using that information to inform our next steps. So at this time, we're gonna hear from Dr. Wilson and her team on the steps staff are taking to adjust to the current context, including how we are going to answer those essential questions that Dr. Smith mentioned what has been the impact of COVID-19 on student learning and their well-being? And what are some of the measures that we are taking to make sure we are addressing the needs based on what we learn from that? So at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wilson to uh, continue that discussion with the team that she's brought here today. Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Thank you Dr. McKnight. Uh, board members, Dr. Smith. Um, one of the requirements um, of the recovery of education plan submitted to MSDE was that we had a plan to identify learning gaps uh, resulting from the interruption to in-person learning uh, when COVID-19 happened uh, in March. Um, because there's no ideal assessment, uh, we know that we have to use a variety of me measures and metrics and MCPS is rich in data sources that are tied to each and every one of our students. Um, so we will be looking not only at the diagnostics that Dr. McKnight referred to, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we'll be looking at our AP and our IB assessment results that came in this summer after students had uh, again, an interruption to that coursework. We'll be looking at the interim grades 
We'll be looking and making sure that we are analyzing and making sure that our ninth graders, our 10th graders, 11th graders, and our 12th graders continue to be on track for graduation. And we'll be able to tell that early on in the school year based on their interim grades. We'll also be using a variety of qualitative and quantitative measures to assess our students. I think one thing that's really important, um, and many of you I know received emails about the use of MAP. And I think traditionally people um, view MAP as an achievement assessment. So automatically um, I, would, I, I understand why um, they immediately had um, a reaction, if you will, or a, a cause to question why we would be using MAP. Well, um, these particular MAP assessments are being used as a diagnostic. Uh, we have a lot of other MAP data that we're able to compare this assessment to where students, quite frankly, left off in the winter months before um, COVID-19 hit. So there will be some comparison ability there, which is extremely valuable to us. Um, also today, besides the diagnostic plan that we'll be sharing with you, I do want to mention that we also will be continuing with our evidence of learning framework. We know how important it is to monitor our students' progress throughout the year after we do these initial diagnostics, and more importantly, after we plan for their instruction. After we get those results, Again, look at interim assessment and other data, um, you know, plan for what the remainder of this year will look like. The second portion of the presentation is connected to the diagnostics and the other metrics. And that will be to uh, share with the board this evening, our plan for the use of the CARES Act tutoring money. Uh, certainly the diagnostics will uh, be informing our work. And finally, uh, we'll be sharing with you an update on the SAT administration, as well as the other metric areas that Dr. Smith already shared, attendance and so forth. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Scott Murphy, um, who will update us on the SAT. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as follow-up to the last meeting, this is a brief update about plans to open access to MCPS buildings for the SAT in partnership with College Board who administers the test. As you know, this is especially important to our seniors who missed out on these opportunities last spring. So we are moving ahead and we'll be administering the first SAT this weekend, Saturday, September 26th at, uh, in 10 schools. And again, the following weekend, Saturday, October 3rd in 12 schools. This will serve approximately 3,000 students who are now registered. Health and safety is the number one priority. Uh, additional sites were added so that we could spread out students. There will be no more than 250 students per site, 10 per classroom, and following all the protocols such as wearing face coverings throughout the duration of testing, distancing protocols, and other protections that will be in place as students enter the building. I have been working very closely with our operations team and also the college board to plan for safety and these testing details. Yesterday, we had an in-person site orientation for all of our SAT coordinators, at which time we walked through all of the logistical aspects of student arrival, check-in, using multiple entrances, moving around the building. Um, the, our facilities management teams will be supporting these operations before, during, after testing to make sure there's ongoing cleaning, moving of furniture, and provisioning for needed supplies. We will also have additional staff on hand to assist with greeting students and monitors in the building to again, promote, reinforce the physical distancing and other safety measures. One of the challenges we were concerned about was whether we were going to have enough proctors who are paid volunteers through the college board. But after an all call to the community, we have had a strong response and have hundreds who have stepped forward to proctor and we are now confident that we will have enough people to safely and effectively administer the tests over the next two weekends in partnership with College Board. I will say uh, additional people can still volunteer by going to the MCPS website to the staff bulletin and there is a posting in the most recent edition. Looking beyond the next two weeks, there will still be additional SAT administrations 
on November 7th and December 5th that are open for student registration. We are still exploring the possibility of SAT school day at the end of October, but final decisions have not yet been made. We are also working with the ACT organization to accommodate students who have registered for ACT special testing with accommodations so that tests can be administered for our students with accommodations uh, during the window that opens late October. Also, lastly, the PSAT has been moved to January of 21, and then hopefully a spring testing season back to the SAT and ACT for our juniors in the springtime. So for now, we are all systems go for the first SAT this weekend, and we'll keep you updated as these activities continue. Now, uh, Mr. Eric Wilson will share information on how we are using other assessments as a diagnostic strategy to meet the learning needs of our students. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Scott. And uh, good, I guess it's almost evening. Uh, Mrs. Evans, uh, members of the board, Dr. Smith, Dr. McKnight. Um, I do have the pleasure as a part of this presentation to talk about our fall diagnostic plan. And um, okay, yep, if we can have that first slide, thank you. So um, as Dr. Wilson and Dr. Smith have shared, uh, due to school closures, um, the state is requiring that all schools provide a fall diagnostic to measure present levels of performance and or learning loss uh, for all K-12 students in both literacy and math. And I think the important thing uh, to, to elevate here is what we plan to do with that information. And Dr. Wilson really teed it up. We're doing it. We're doing a variety of things. Uh, we're going to to use this information to determine which students will come back to our building when safe to do so. Um, we're going to use this information to determine um, who will take part in some of our, our CARES Act tutoring, which you'll hear later on about. Um, and it's also helping teachers to prescribe the needs of students in real time. So where are the learning gaps and what type of immediate uh, supports and interventions can we provide to students? So really the diagnostics help to tell a story about each individual student uh, since March of, of the spring. Next slide. So uh, MSDE has informed us that um, we will be having state assessments this year. Um, but we, we don't, we didn't take assessments last spring and it's uncertain when we'll have that data. So um, I just really wanted to underscore the importance of our continued implementation of our evidence of learning measures. Um, through our evidence of learning framework, uh, we use multiple measures of achievement to allow for a more complex view of student readiness. Uh, data that is obtained through our classroom, district, and external measures uh, really give us a fuller pictures of where students are, uh, what skill gaps exist, and, uh, and it really helps us to ask, the, ask and answer the questions that Dr. Smith is always sharing with us. Are students learning and are they learning enough? And then what are we going to do about it? Um, and we did just recently receive some information that, um, you know, our Algebra 1 and our ELA assessments in high school uh, will be continuing, um, you know, from a, a, a January to, uh, excuse me, a December to January window. So uh, more information to come. But all that to say, um, state assessments are here and we just need to continue to be prepared for them as we move forward throughout this school year. Next slide. So as I said, um, we've been looking at our external, internal and classroom assessments. Obviously uh, COVID came and uh, it's changing what some of these measures are going to look like for us. Um, but as Dr. Wilson said, one of the measures that gives us a wealth of information and it can help to provide some comparative data are the measures of academic progress or our MAP data. Uh, we've been administering MAP at the elementary and middle school levels for many years, and it serves as a consistent data point 
for assessing where our students are and helping us monitor student progress. So as we're using this diagnostic tool in MCPS, the map offers a level of alignment and familiarity for staff and students. So it's not just one more thing. So in addition to it being a very reliable source of data, um, we're not adding something extra for teachers to have to learn and implement as our diagnostic tool. And as we progress throughout the year, we will continue to explore other options to really know and understand our student well being and engagement and determine how best to respond to our student needs. Next slide. So when we view our elementary fall diagnostic plan. Again, we cannot elevate enough that assessments are about diagnostic and prescription based on the results that we will receive. Um, in addition, you'll see uh, the Maryland Ready to Read Act passed the uh, Maryland General Assembly in 2018 requires that all students in grades K and 1 take a universal screener to measure early literacy skills. Uh, we will be using uh, the MAP Reading Fluency Assessment in our district, or the MAP RF, uh, for this purpose. Um, our use of the MAP RF, uh, again, provides consistency and alignment to our overall evidence of learning accountability framework. Um, uh, the biggest change that you'll notice uh, as you look at our diagnostic preview is that this is a virtual assessment this year. Uh, the testing window was originally set for uh, September 8th through October the 9th um, for our, our map growth data to come back. But due to technical difficulties uh, with the vendor, NWEA, this window has now been extended to October the 14th. And as of last Friday, uh, the vendor has reported that technical challenges have been resolved and testing should continue without any further system outages. Next slide. And you can see from our middle school diagnostic window, in addition to the map diagnostic, our students will also be engaged in our district assessment opportunities in both literacy and math, um, as well as our English language learners uh, with, with their different assessments that, that they're taking as well. Next slide. So that brings us to MAP in high school. And uh, MAP in high school, is, it's, it's, it's not a new phenomenon. It's, it's typically used to collect additional data for students in grade 9 and 10. But it, it is a, a new assessment to administer in grade 11 through 12 for our teachers. But again, it's not new for our students. Uh, they've been taking MAP for many years, our current high school students. So they understand uh, what the MAP test is and what it represents. Uh, just some of the differences, though, that MAP does align with uh, common core grade level standards. So it's curriculum agnostic. So it's not course alike or course specific. Um, and then the test does have an adaptive nature to it, um, which will allow students to go above or in sometimes below their uh, given grade band level. Uh, for this reason, students may advance to test items that include content that they're currently engaged in or have never seen before. So a student that is in honors um, algebra two uh, that is going to be taking a map, that can be useful data uh, for that particular classroom teacher uh, to provide support or enrichment through gaps in foundational skills needed for higher order math and or literacy. So uh, there is value to taking the map um, across uh, all grade levels in high school. We can go on to the next slide. And again, you can see from our high school diagnostic window that students will also be engaged in our district assessment opportunities in both literacy and math um, throughout this fall period. Next slide. Uh, 
In terms of logistics, um, we've provided a number of professional learning opportunities for our teachers to meet the challenges uh, that this virtual assessment has brought us. Um, our partners in the Office of Technology and Innovation have provided a variety of outstanding resources, such as screencasts and webinars to assist teachers and families with technology troubleshooting. Schools have developed implementation plans that use an array of schedules to avoid interrupting core instructional time, such as the use of the Wednesdays or meeting in groups outside of reading or math blocks. Uh, and you may have heard uh, board members, one particular area of struggle has been in the administration of our uh, K-2 reading assessment, our MAP-RF. Um, the login process for this assessment has proved to be challenging uh, for some of our younger learners, but uh, schools, as they always have been doing, have collaborated together to identify best practices for helping students to log in and complete the assessments. Uh, we'll continue to troubleshoot and work to improve this experience. Um, so just some examples that I've seen in the schools that I supervise, uh, we've been resetting the passwords to be the same password every day. So A, B, C, D, E, one, two, three, four, five. If I, if I can do that over and over again, eventually I'm going to be able to get into that assessment uh, without a lot of challenges. And then uh, we're also teaching our younger learners how to screen share. Uh, that helps parents and staff members uh, with some of the troubleshooting uh, challenges that we've come up with, come up against. Um, and our teachers do understand the value of the data that we're collecting, and they continue to stay engaged, committed, and uh, will persevere through the process. Uh, we get emails every day from principals. Wow, this is really, really hard. But uh, we just encourage them to stay the course because they, they understand the importance of of that data and what we're going to be using it for. Uh, next slide. So our students with disabilities, uh, 504 plans, English language, excuse me, English language learners will receive assessment accommodations. Um, and but I, the important thing to understand here is that families um, will not be responsible for implementing these accommodations. It is the responsibility of the school system, and it's not something that we expect our parents to provide. So we are leveraging the use of all staff members. It's all hands on deck in our schools to provide the one to one or small group accommodations as needed. Next slide. While all students uh, must be administered a diagnostic assessment, as I've stated, there is a small percentage of students for whom the MAP assessment is not an appropriate measure. Uh, diagnostic data for students with significant cognitive disabilities working towards alternate learning outcomes uh, will be gathered using a variety of processes. Um, teachers of, of students um, that fit this category, which is uh, typically uh, some of our, our self-contained uh, programs, uh, will be reviewing their quarter three progress notes uh, from last spring, and they'll determine what students have mastered and what their instructional levels were at the time. So during this assessment windows, teachers will be collecting data to see if, if the uh, progress has been made, if some of those uh, instructional levels are still in place, and what, what the current instructional level is so that we can provide the best sound instruction um, for our students. Uh, teachers have been provided a very robust data collection tool to support the documentation of this information and show progress over time. So it's diagnostic for everyone and um, it's, it's rigorous diagnostic for everyone. Next slide. Through all of our uh, MAP and diagnostic implementation, communication with parents has been a vital part of this process. Um, our principals have been outstanding, credible messengers to share the, the need for students to complete the assessment unassisted. 
Uh, we are trying to get uh, some valid and reliable data. And the purpose is to see what students know and to help plan for instruction. Uh, it's not a performance measure. It's a measure for learning and impact. And there really is no value for parents in assisting their kids with, with answers. And uh, our principals have been uh, great stewards of that message uh, to their communities as we have engaged in the implementation. Um, we have leveraged the support of our partners in the Office of Family uh, and Student Engagement to support our English language learners with bilingual counselors, parent community coordinators to assist with technology troubleshooting at home. And um, I'm not going to say that it, it has not been, um, that it's been easy. It uh, definitely has been a challenge. But again, that spirit of collaboration, that spirit of galvanizing together as a community, um, you know, has really helped us to meet these challenges head on. Um, so in closing, um, the implementation um, has been a challenge, but the urgent need to gather prescriptive data on our students is definitely worth the time and effort um, that all of our staff has, has put into play here. So um, with that, um, I, that concludes my part of the presentation. And so Mrs. Evans, I will turn it back over to you for questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I will start with um, Mr. Asante with questions, comments. We'll do one question and we'll come back around and see if people have additional questions. Great. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. I wanted to like echo the uh, part about technical difficulties. I remember during my MAP session testing, um, a lot of students were facing technical difficulties. So I'm glad that that was worked out. I was wondering, since this testing is new, for high school students, what what are the results being compared to since um, with other grade levels, they have taken this testing prior to COVID recently. So what is this, what, is, what are the results from this testing for high school students being compared to? Sure, so um, in grade nine, it's pretty easy. So we can go back and pull um, some of the winter data, right, when they were eighth graders. Um, even, even in grade 10, um, I, I think you had several students in grade nine that, that may have taken a map to get some data. But I think the, the best way to look at it, uh, Nicholas, is the, um, the, the, the standard or the strand uh, of content that comes from the MAP assessment um, is pretty universal across different uh, you know, course specific areas. So I, I think looking as teachers unpack the data and they see which particular content strands that students uh, may have had challenges with, that's gonna be a good comparative data as they're moving forward in their course specific uh, work. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Evans, if I may, I'd like to add on to Eric's very good response there. Um, Absolutely. Nick, one of the other advantages is that the MAP assessment is, is referred to as an adaptive assessment. So what that means is you can keep going, the sky's the limit in terms of being able to challenge yourself uh, for the, the concepts that um, the MAP test is asking if you have uh, the knowledge, skill, and ability to do. So if students are challenged by a certain level of mathematics where they should be, it gives us that information, but yet it does also the opposite. It reassures us that students are moving beyond uh, where, we would, where we would reasonably expect them to be given their grade level and their math sequence. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. And we will move to Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, I have a question about the SAT uh, update. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, the 3,000 students uh, that we are serving, uh, how, does, how does that compare to the number of students who would typically take the SAT around this time of year and um, it, to previous years. Uh, is it more, is it less because of COVID? Um, and uh, do we have any demographic uh, information on 
who these 3,000 students are. Um, you know, my concern is, uh, you know, that uh, Latinx students, Latinx students, uh, African American students, uh, you know, are in fact uh, taking these exams at the same levels that uh, we've seen uh, white and Asian students uh, take it in the past. Do we have any information about that? We do not right now, Ms. Dixon. We can follow up and get that to you, uh, comparing to prior years and also the demographics of these roughly 3,000. Um, keep in mind that um, being the national administrations on Saturdays, some of these 3,000 are actually non-MCPS students uh, right. from other jurisdictions or from non-public schools. So once we opened up our, our testing centers, as happened across the state, um, these were high demand. Um, so, but to your question about who the students are, you know, we have to now get that from the college board, analyze it, compare it to prior years, and we can certainly do that as a follow-up. So do we know how many MCPS students then that we're serving if we are serving other would, students from other jurisdictions? Because this is really important in terms of seniors and their applications to colleges and, um, you know, I'm very concerned about them having the opportunity, if the SAT is still a requirement for admission, um, and certainly those who want to have early admission, uh, you know, be considered for that as well, uh, that they have those opportunities. Uh, I would think that, you know, the counselors might be able to, you know, help with this. I would think that the high schools would, would know, uh, you know, their students who have registered. We were notified by the college board that approximately 20% of those 3,000 um, were non-MCPS students. Um, that's how it works with the national administrations, as you know. Um, okay. Keep in okay. mind too that um, the, there, the, the SAT is being offered the next two Saturdays, including October 3rd, which is not yet full. Right. Yeah. So I would think that, you know, if our students aren't, uh, you know, registered, uh, we would redouble our efforts, be very aggressive in, uh, you know, counseling students and, uh, you know, helping them get uh, signed up. Okay. Thank you very much. If I may, Ms. Dixon, uh, thank you for raising that because uh, that is something that we'll need to look at as Mr. Murphy shared in the presentation earlier, in many ways we were able to serve or know who exactly we were serving in our student bodies when we offered the in-school testing on the testing date, because we know that was primarily, you know, open right. up to right. students. Right, you know, and so that will also be a part of the discussion as we continue to plan to see what, what uh, options we have in that space, how that then also has to be considered um, in our students and, and their uh, participation in the Saturday test. This is Mondrowski. Yep, so thank you all for the presentation, that part of the presentation. Um, Ms. Dixon asked my question more or less, so, um, so that's pretty much um, was my biggest concern as well um, and about the payment and whether or not, you know, we're still um, letting people know that they don't have to pay for their first test, whether it's an, I, I think we're also doing ACT now, right? Not just SATs, but oh, yeah. either way, just making sure that we're communicating with families and making sure that there are, we know who's taking the test and who's not. Um, the only other question that I had was about the assessments um, that will be used in the fall diagnostic to determine present levels and allow the measurement of growth over time. Will we be doing the um, assessments in the spring, administering the assessments in the spring in the same manner with which we're administering them now, just for comparison? Sure, so, um, right. So MAP uh, is one of our external measures and evidence of learning. So we, we definitely will be continuing that with that. In terms of our 11th and 12th graders, um, you know, there's always some flexibility in terms of maybe looking at other different data around um, ar around their proficiency uh, as, as we move forward. So, uh, but definitely MAP 
will be in place uh, as one of our external measures. What, what I wanted to say is college and career readiness for our 11th and 12th graders. So we'll be looking at SAT, um, uh, different different uh, measures of that nature. Okay, but are we communicating with higher education as well to make sure that we're providing and preparing for what they're gonna be looking at? I mean, I know that they are all aware of the extraordinary circumstances. We just wanna make sure that we're giving our kids you know, as the best opportunities possible, so. Absolutely, yes. So, yep, we'll, we'll make sure that, well, there, there's a lot of great um, data that comes out of that map. So as we continue to build the capacity of our teachers and administrators to, to really dissect and diagnose that data, I think it's really going to help uh, some of the skills and supports um, around some of the, the higher level courses that some of our kids are taking. Vice President Wolf. Uh, yes, I have a question about the map assessment mm -hmm. for uh, K through two. Mm -hmm. I think you're using it as a diagnostic testing. I, I'm concerned about the validity of it, particularly with so many parents on the side holding up fingers and, and toes to help their kids do the do the assessment. How do, how do you determine that this information is reliable for what you're obtaining it for? Right. I think, uh, and that's an excellent question, Mrs. Wolf. Um, I, I, I think it's a starting point for us. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's it, well, one thing that we wanted to make sure is that um, we had a, a, a standard uh, tool that was aligned across the system. And, um, you know, using MAP was just going to be, um, you know, not, not something different that the teachers have had to implement. Um, but I, obviously, we're going to be using other sources of data uh, that classroom teachers have collected to help give us a fuller picture around that. But I think as a system-wide tool uh, to collect some baseline data, um, I, I think we'll take a look and uh, see where we are. Um, there, there were some assessments, I think, uh, that did take place for some of the students that uh, took place in the kindergarten jumpstart program over the summer. So that can be some different alignment that we can look at too, to see, you know, how did they fare on some of those assessments based on some of the baseline data that we've collected. But, uh, but for sure, I think the uh, validity piece is something that we'll continue to explore um, you know, as we administer this with our, our parent community. Uh, Ms. Evans, if I could also chime in on Ms. Wolf's question. Um, the map reading fluency and um, the math, uh, the map math for both K to two, um, the map reading fluency in particular is that screener that MSDE requires of us to do. And so it was it really was doing double duty, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. It satisfies a criteria that we have to fulfill with MSDE. But again, the beauty of, re, of util, utilizing the, the MAP math flu, fluency is that we have the data on our second graders and our first graders from last year prior to COVID. So we'll be able again to do that comparison. And I do think that as teachers see those results and as Eric pointed out, you know, they'll do assessments within the benchmark uh, English language arts assessment. And I think they'll be able to see where there's uh, possibly anomalies that may have come forward in those testing results that may not indicate that the students have those foundational skills that were appearing to be in place on the diagnostic. And that's why we need to use multiple measures and not rely just on that one, um, one diagnostic measure. That was a great question though. <laughs> Thank you. And so now we will go to Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, well, uh, I want to piggyback about the SATs. I know there are an awful lot of families that are breathing a sigh of relief that they're being given here in the county since we ha didn't have the March administration, you know, April, May, June, July. And, you know, while many colleges are um, test optional, nevertheless, you know, for those seniors 
at those schools, it, it you know, it's very positive that we are going forward. Um, and I hope that we can do the in-school SAT administration because that is a very equitable way of doing it. Um, I, I think the word of the day for me is hard, you know, the virtual learning has been hard for our teachers. Um, we hear repeatedly the number of hours. I, I heard from people a tremendous amount of frustration about the map testing, um, you know, the glitches with technology. And I'm with Brenda. I guess I am a skeptic about the validity of the map assessments under these circumstances in the virtual world, whether parents were there assisting or providing guidance to their students, I don't know. And and I know that the timing sort of mirrors when we do this, but I still think people are getting their sea legs with virtual learning and, and particularly it's hard for our youngest learners. There's no way around it. So I, I don't know how accurate these will really be. Uh, Ms. Evans, if, if I may, thank you, Ms. Um, O'Neill, for bringing that forward. So as we consider all of these circumstances that you all are so eloquently raising, uh, I just want to elevate the fact that Dr. Wilson mentioned, we are going to be relying heavily on comparison data is the best way that I can say it in terms of those students who we have worked with uh, and have assessment data from in the past, because that's going to highlight for us any inconsistencies that we have to look at to say, you know, this is grossly different from what we had before, what could have impacted it positively or negatively. And so as we bring back, um, as we navigate through all of this, how our students are doing, it will be very reflective of how we've had to use those comparative measures to help us better understand the complexities of where our students are right now and what the different factors have been that impact how they uh, perform in these circumstances because there are so many factors that are quite frankly um, not controllable <laughs> that we have controlled in the past in all of our test environments. And so I we could not agree with you more. These are all the things that we're taking and that's why we emphasize it's about looking at the uh, the measure of learning impact and not, you know, really kind of taking this theme out of a, uh, it's not a performance measure because we don't want our students or our families to feel like this is going to be solidified in the way we've got lots of comparison to do to make sure we understand the complexities of every learner in this. So thank you for raising that because it's a conversation that we will have to continue uh, knowing that there are so many different circumstances around the, how we're able to administer assessments given these circumstances. Right. And if I may, uh, just to tag on to what Dr. McKnight said, um, I, I, that is, I think, the beauty of having the evidence of learning structure in place over these last few years, because we do have a wealth of data to go back to that we can do these comparisons, not just what happened last year, but even the year prior for most of our students. And certainly I'm not talking about kindergartner students, uh, you know, in as I'm speaking about this, but we would have pre-K data for those that were with us. But that is the wealth of that comparative data and the richness of the evidence of learning um, and being able to look at those diagnostics in the light of previous data. And just one other some comment. Oh, Dr. Smith, I mean, off the top of my head, how many millions of dollars do we receive approximately from the state every year? For our total operating budget? Yeah. About $700 million. It's about, so, it's about a third of our budget. Yeah. You know, I may not like everything that's happening right now, but the issues that are imposed on us, the assessment requirements are 700 million reasons why there are certain things we have to do. And it is really hard, And but we can't do without that money. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for bringing that forward uh, because we are part of the state of Maryland and we do receive 
about a third of our operating budget from the state of, of Maryland, and this is their requirement. And we have to start sometime. And, li and like all of us have said, it's hard, but we have to figure this out because uh, our students need us to, to do the best we can possibly do with everything we do. And, and we're, we're learning all the time, every day. DACA, comment, question. Yeah, I just wanna thank uh, Dr. Wilson and Mr. Murphy and uh, uh, Mr. Wilson for all the details that you've given us about what the plans were and what kind of testing you're doing. I do think it's important that we keep saying that this is diagnostic, that this is something that teachers do every year after the summer vacation. They want to know where their students are and where they need to fill in the gaps. So thank you for the presentation. And I know how hard you've worked on this and we can only hope for the best for our students, but at least you're trying to figure out where we need to go in order to really help them uh, as in the advanced courses and SATs and as well as elementary. Okay, and we're still doing just one question, Ms. Silvestri. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about MAP in the high schools. Mm. Um, is this something that you will continue to administer after we get out of this remote learning crisis? Um, is this a good external metric? Because um, I, I believe we were lacking external measures for high school students, and that is the reason we used eligibility as one. Um, so I just wanted to understand why we didn't do it before, and is this something that you want to continue uh, after we go back to brick and mortar? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, and I, I hope Dr. Wilson is still nearby. Um, is it something that will continue? I, I, I think it really depends on what the data sh shows us, Ms. Silvestri. Um, you know, the, the one thing about the, the, the MAP and the NWEA um, ecosystem, if you will, is it really provides a, a, a launch off for teachers to really understand what are the skills that students need. So you get this uh, RIT score, um, which you probably heard of, of, of the RIT scores that go along with MAP. It's really about um, you know, in, informing instruction. So I think from that standpoint, if, if we are to continue, particularly with our juniors and seniors with MAP, it really is going to be based on the level of diagnostic data that comes as a result of what skills uh, still need to be solidified for students to be successful for college and career readiness, um, SAT, ACUPLACER, ACT assessments. So it's, it's really unpacking the standards that come across uh, through the MAP um, assessment and, and the data from that particular ecosystem. Um, if I may um, add, add to what Eric has said, um, in the past, we have focused more on the college and career readiness measures as defined by MSDE um, to, in, that, in terms of our external measures. And Eric just mentioned many of those, the ACT, um, the SAT, dual enrollment, uh, early college, all of those measures. The map has never been used in the high school, but one of the um, value adds to it right now is that adaptive measure piece. And if students really, uh, you know, put their time and energy into it, it really gives them a really good window into how they'll do on the more rigorous assessments because they are standards aligned and um, they, the sky's the limit. They, as long as they continue to, to um, have correct answers, they move through the standards. Um, so uh, another question and I've answered many parents who have inquired, if my student does well on the high school map assessment, will, will he have to take the later assessments, map assessments in the year? And, and my response has been, 
we'll look at the diagnostic and see there is no reason if they've exceeded where they need to be for them to continue to take a MAP assessment. Uh, but we'll be looking at that information as the testing uh, comes in. And we, we missed so many high school assessments last year um, that we just felt that this would be a value add to us at this point in the year because we didn't have the park assessments or other things to go on from the spring. It just gives us an additional measure. Okay, great. So before we um, move on to the next presentation, I just wanted to quickly ask board members if they have um, a question that could take a total of two minutes so we can move on. So, okay. Uh, so we just have Ms. Silvestri. Two minutes, I'm gonna time you. <laughs> okay. It'll be pretty quick. Um, for all the, the cases that we heard where there were technology glitches with the map implementation, do they retake it? Right, my understanding is that they can pause where they were and start or and pick up from where they have left off is is my understanding and i i do want to mention that this was not our local technologies in terms of the glitch this was nwea's um, site that was causing the instability um, it was not a local problem at all in fact they notified us and asked us that tuesday of the first week, I believe that we were administrating administering that we if we could stop, and then a couple of days later, their engineers um, uh, created a patch and fixed uh, the stability of the site. So I have not heard much more about any instability, but I do want to make mention of that um, so that folks know that NWEA was working very closely with us to um, stabilize their site. Yeah, and, and also to Ms. Silvestri, just again, um, just to applaud the teachers and the administrators in our schools in terms of really reassuring the students and the families, being part of those breakout rooms to help troubleshoot. Um, it's It's been great. And um, as Dr. Smith said, right, we're we're taking a very challenging circumstance and we're making the very best of it as we can, you know, thanks to our staff. Thank you. So at this time, Ms. Oh, go ahead. Ms. Evans, this is Jack Smith. May I have 45 seconds? You can. <laughs> and I will stay under that. First of all, we'll send an invitation to the board members. And if you would like to sign on with uh, somebody in Dr. Wilson's division and just kind of go through a tutorial and see what it all looks like, We'll make that available to you. So we'll send that invitation to you and then you can see if you want to look at a map test and how it's working at the, the level. And secondly, I've got to say thank you to literally hundreds and hundreds of staff because this SAT business has been a heavy lift. And so not only to Mr. Murphy, but to many, many, many people to get this up and running and and certainly to all 24,000 of our staff who have just been champions for our students. Absolutely. So at this time, we will let you all proceed the next portion of the presentation on the CARES Act funding. Okay, good evening, everyone. Oh, okay. okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Nikki Hazel uh, from Curriculum and Instructional Programs. I want to talk a little bit, um, kind of weaving in what Eric just presented with the assessment presentation to how we are going to use that information to help support some of our students. And so a portion of the CARES Act funding is going to be dedicated to supporting students who are experiencing significant learning loss, who've experienced it during this pandemic uh, season. And we're gonna be providing enrichment programming for students before or after school. Our goal is to, if you wanna uh, hit the next slide, um, our goal is to accelerate uh, the learning of our students so they're able to access grade level content. And we want to make sure that they're able to move through the school year as quickly as possible and we can accelerate their learning. If you go to the next slide. Our principals will be working with their teachers and teacher leaders to identify students 
by reviewing the fall diagnostic data that Eric just went through. Um, and also we'll be using previous data sources from our evidence of learning data. We intend for groups of students to be very small, anywhere from one to five students in a group. And the focus of these small groups will be to address academic loss, uh, student engagement and well-being. And we will utilize approved math and reading evidence-based interventions um, for the instruction of our students um, in this enrichment program. Next slide. So the sessions will last from 60 to 90 minutes and we'll have a similar structure across all of our schools with an opening, a main lesson and closing activity. Um, and during our training of our teachers and teacher leaders, we will really stress the importance of developing relationships with the students and taking the time to um, begin and end their sessions with that social emotional um, component. So we really think that that's really critical as we move through this work. The next slide. Okay, finally, our tutoring funds will support um, hiring teachers, paraeducators, substitute teachers. We will also be purchasing additional instructional materials um, for those approved interventions. Uh, and we also will be supporting one of our partners, George B. Thomas Learning Academy, in um, purchasing scholarships for students to participate in their Saturday program, along with um, using some of that the CARES funding to bring back our homework hotline. And we're really excited about um, having our students get additional support through that venue. Um, we'll continue after we have exhausted our CARES funds, we will continue to utilize our operating budget to provide additional tutoring sessions throughout the school year. So at this time, I think I will stop to see if there are any questions. Sure, thank you for that presentation. I'll start with um, Mrs. Mondrowski. Do you have any questions? If you don't, that's fine. Okay. And so what I'll do, you do? Okay, okay. So what I'll do is if, um, I'm just gonna ask board members, can you give me a thumbs up if you have a question? If not, we can proceed to the next portion of the presentation. If I don't see a thumb, I'm gonna move on. I don't see thumbs, I'm moving on. So thank you, Ms. Hazel. We'll go to by the numbers next. Hey, I think that's me. Um, thank you everyone for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hazel. Um, the section I'm gonna discuss, if we could put the slides up. There we go. Um, is in regards to uh, enrollment and attendance. Uh, you heard from Dr. Smith that uh, we'll be sharing a lot of numbers uh, with you today. So gonna go through those numbers um, and uh, you know, just to go over kind of an overview with our enrollment and also with our attendance um, as we've been monitoring it the first few weeks of school. Um, it's important to note that the data is preliminary and unofficial due to enrollment numbers fluctuating within the first weeks of school as all schools right now are verifying student enrollment, processing, their, processing the entries and their withdrawals. Um, and, but as you can see, if we go to the first chart, Um, our first chart shows our unofficial enrollment for August 30th, September 7th, and September 13th. Uh, and you can see that it's fluctuated from 161,352 students on August 30th to 162,342 students on September uh, 30th, excuse me, September 13th. If you go to the next slide, please. We also wanted to provide this data by student group and service areas uh, for which you will see reflected on this slide and broken down. Um, if you could just take a look at that. Um, next slide, please. As we discussed, our enrollment district-wise has decreased a little over 3,400 students. On this slide, you can see the trends in our enrollment when compared to the 2019 school year. From this view, you're able to see the difference in enrollment by grade level. However, it's important to note that nearly two thirds of the total difference is directly related to kindergarten and pre-kindergarten enrollment. 
We've been closely monitoring this enrollment as we predicted that the pandemic could have an impact on students returning to school. We could go to the next slide. Furthermore, we're monitoring enrollment and we're also keeping data on withdrawals. From the slide, we are able to examine the withdrawal codes from our, that our school system uses to monitor students who withdraw. We monitor this data to examine trends across the school system, and I wanted to draw your attention to a few data points. First, if you look at withdrawal code number 15, you will see that this year we have a slightly higher number of students who have transferred to a non-public school in Montgomery County. Last year, there were 908 students transferring into a non-public school compared to just over 1,100 this year. Another data point that I'd like to draw to your attention is the number of students transferring to another public school in the state of Maryland. Last year, we had 1,444 students leave to another public school in Maryland. This year, that number dropped to 1,092. And finally, if you add up all of the withdrawals together from all of these codes, you will notice that that number is higher than 3,400 students, the number of withdrawals that we've seen. However, we want to recognize that we are continuing to enroll students each day in our system, which is why the numbers that we are sharing today are subject to change and unofficial. If you go to the next slide, please. In regards to attendance, we wanted to provide you with an update on attendance for the first weeks of school. Now we're gonna get a little bit technical here, so bear with me. You will notice that the, the, on this slide that the two numbers for attendance are basically in two data sets. One data set is shown as 33% slash 66%, and the other data set is shown to 50% slash 90%. These ratios are how the state of Maryland calculates absences. To explain it further, basically, if a student was absent below 33% of the day or two hours, they are considered present for the day. If they were absent more than 66% of the day or four hours, it would be considered a full day absence for the student. The, the Maryland State Board of Education is now using a new calculation that requires schools to report absences using a 50% slash 90% ratio. So if a student is absent below 50% of their day or three hours, they are considered present. If they are absent 90% of the day or greater, it would be considered a full day absence. So it's a little bit confusing, but we wanted to present this data to you in this manner. So first of all, it's consistent with the way that MSDAE is collecting the data, but it's also going to give you an idea of how we can compare the data to years past. And that's where, if you look on this slide to the, the, the uh, data slide, or the graph to the right, you will notice that there we, we have it calculated in both ways, but let's go back to the first week of school. And we now can go back to 2018. And based on that data, what we can see is, uh, we can see the, our, in, our, our attendance for the first day of school um, is approximately lower and then on the second week of school, that, that attendance actually increases. And if you can see from 2018, that, uh, that trend continues. From 2019, that trend also continues. And then uh, for this year, we see the same trend continuing. If we go to the next slide, please. We also wanted to examine our preliminary unofficial attendance due data to identify which students were absent from school. And I think we had a conversation at our last Board of Education meeting about wanting to know which students um, who, are, who are not gonna be coming to school. So you can see on this slide, a breakdown by student level, demographics and student group and service group when comparing data from September 4th and from September 11th. You will notice that there are more students absent in poverty in African-American, Hispanic student groups when compared to whiter Asian students. You will also notice that there are fewer special education students absent to students who do not receive special education services. Finally, you will also notice that there are fewer students who are receiving ESOL who are absent compared to those who don't receive ESOL services. We'll continue to monitor this data and support all students through our well-being teams that Mr. Neff will speak with shortly in our presentation. Next slide, please. 
In the last data slide, we wanted to provide an update with a number of students who have been taking advantage of the flexibility for reconciling absences when they have been unable to attend live instruction. As of September 5th, 1,643 students completed our virtual absence reconciliation form to reconcile those absence if for some reason they were unable to attend live instruction. One week later on September 12th, 1,512 students completed the reconciliation form. From this data, we are seeing that many families and students are taking advantage of the flexibility to attend live instruction at a more convenient time. We have evidence that the system of reconciling missed live instruction is successful and continuing to be used by our students and families. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Pete Cevanini, Associate Superintendent for Technology and Innovation, who will talk about technology numbers and then the connection to technology systems. Thank you, Ms. McGee. Good evening, Ms. Evans, board members, Dr. Smith and Dr. McKnight. Tonight, I'm going to give you a brief update on the technology efforts in connecting and implementing the services that enhance teaching and learning in this virtual environment. First slide, thank you. First, I want to give you an update on the number of devices that were reported last time to this time. So we have distributed almost 2,000 more student Chromebooks since the last update two weeks ago. We're up to 134,895 devices. We've distributed over 700 more devices to staff at 23,089, and we've delivered almost 1,000 more modified devices to students and families at 7,027. I want to thank Melissa Morrow, Brandon Farrell, Scott Hughes, Tom Chapman, Chuck McGee, and the entire warehouse and ITSS team for their continued amazing work on this effort, whether it is distributing devices or supporting the help desk that is been inundated with calls, they're always there to support our work in this virtual learning environment. I would also be remiss in not also thanking our friends in transportation, security, OTLS, communication, and special ed who have also played a key role in all this work. Beyond the devices, we have successfully held over 322,000 Zoom classes to, since last, up to last Friday. We've had almost 1.5 million MyMPS logins, almost a million student synergy logins, and almost 900,000 parent and guardian logins to Synergy. The teams who have supported this work under the leadership of Dr. Traincamp have done so much work behind the scenes to launch and support these platforms. They're doing great work and it's evidenced by the huge numbers. Next slide, please. Could you move up one more slide, please? Thank you. Here's the data on what this work has meant for students. So two weeks ago, I reported that about 97% of students had already connected to at least one platform, either MyMPS Classroom or Zoom. I reported that 4,349 students, or about 3%, had not connected. However, I have good news to share that as of Friday, that number has improved to 99% with only 2,149 students not connecting yet. The chart on the screen shows the, how the group of students breaks down by key demographics. Our school teams have been very hard at work reaching out to students and families and getting them connected to our system. Mr. Neff will now talk about the follow-up efforts that his team has done on this very important work. Mr. Neff? Thank you, Mr. Cevanini. Um, good evening, Dr. Smith, Dr. G Dr. Knight, McKnight, members of the Board of Education. Um, in the last Board of Education meeting, I brought a colleague along and she and I spoke about the establishment and implementation of student well-being teams. This slide is an data that is evidence of the fruits of their labor. What you will see on this slide is nearly 8,000 home visits that were conducted. This is data collected from the start of the school year through last Wednesday, September 16th. 75% um, of those home visits were done virtually. 
And like all data tend to do, they generate questions for us and they generate items that we need to act on. So a couple of key pieces related to this data that we know we now need to do. Um, we need to develop a more robust data collection system for our student well-being teams and our directors from our student school support and improvement have set that expectation for schools because we need to be able to drill down to the data, um, not only to present to the board and to other en entities as a reporting mechanism, but we also want individual schools to be able to drill down to their data to think about which student groups are being referred most often, which student groups are not engaging at the level that we would like. And so they can think not only responsively to referrals to the student well-being team, but proactively if there's a specific grade level, or if there's a st specific student population, or maybe there is a neighborhood or an apartment complex that needs some proactive outreach, that drill down data will allow them to do that. The other thing the data show us with about 25% of our home visits being done in person is that we have a growing level of comfortability with staff members being willing to go out into the community so that we know that we need to think about what protective equipment they need and what are some guidelines and strategies we want them to engage in during those live home visits as more people get comfortable doing so, so that the health and safety of our staff members and our families who are visiting is maintained. I'd like to turn it out over now to my colleague, Ms. McGuire. Thank you. I just want to provide a quick update for you on where we are with our meal distribution uh, in this school year. We um, are continuing, our, our number of meals served is continuing to increase every day. Um, and we served 275,000 meals through last Friday. And I can tell you that today we crossed over the 300,000 mark um, for the year, for the school year beginning on August 31st. We have made some adjustments to our program and we are continuing to do that um, as we've talked about with our increasing experience um, through the school year and also with the extension of the waivers that we were able to secure through the federal and state governments. We are now serving triple meals every Friday. Um, this is a way that we are really pleased to be able to serve and provide additional food to our families over the weekend. Um, and again, it's something that we're able to do while we do have the extended waivers um, on the uh, summer food program. We are still at 74 schools and we do have five bus stop sites in the neighborhoods. We are expanding the number of bus stop sites in the coming weeks and we anticipate being able to add some uh, additional sites even as early as next week. Um, and then we'll continue to roll out over the next uh, few weeks some additional sites and we'll be um, sharing that information as soon as possible. What we're going to be doing here is really focusing on some of those neighborhood bus stops where there are large numbers of families, but also they may be separated from a school that's serving food by a major road or other obstacles that really prevent them from being able to access those meals as easily as we would like. Um, and so we, um, again, we've, we really appreciate the advocacy and um, information and sharing that we've heard from our community. Um, really appreciate that a number of our um, community advocates and parent advocates have shared some of the information about some of these kinds of sites and where those needs are. And we're really happy to be able to turn our attention to that and to, um, again, be able to, to be responsive and help serve our families where they are and where they need it most. All right, thank you so much. And so at this time, we will open it up for board comments and um, for board questions, for board questions. Um, 6.03, our meeting should be ending at 6.15. We're gonna work real closely to get us out of here by 6.30 at the latest. I just want you all to know that. I wanna respect your time and the Zooming that we've been doing. So I'm gonna start with Mrs. Silvestri. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mrs. Madrowski, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I'll start off with the, you know, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for all of your work that you've done on this. I know that this has not been easy, um, and it's a lot to monitor and everything. I do appreciate so much the people who've gone out and done the in-person, um, in-home visits, even the, and the virtual home visits. Um, I think it's so important that we stay connected to our students. 
just a couple of things, and I don't really know that it's a question per se, except for the fact, um, you know, I'm still hearing so many concerns from our staff about the connectability with their um, with the technology that they're using um, and the troubleshooting, um, the abundance of time that it's taking to do troubleshooting, um, and more even probably even more than that, the um, the platforms that we're using. I don't know what the specific question is other than necessarily how we're addressing that. Is it possible? Someone had suggested that board members take a, do a training or have uh, like be shown how it all works. Is that something that we could do to better understand what it is that they're doing, you know, our, our, we're expecting of our staff and our students to participate in and um, and how challenging it is and what the compatibility issues are and things like that. Sure, we can absolutely, when we send the invitation about the MAP uh, test to board members mm -hmm. who are interested, we'll also send an invitation to go through the different, uh, you know, how do you take attendance and what's the, what's the relationship between uh, synergy and Canvas and how do those relate to Zoom and will we can go through all of those things? Um, okay, absolutely. Okay, I appreciate it. I have a couple other questions, but I'll wait till you come back around. Thank you, Miss um, Wolf. I, I think my question is kind of a follow up to uh, Miss Mandrowski. We're hearing <clears throat> that there's so many questions about the uh, of having several different platforms about even the lack of Google Classroom, which apparently some people would like to see us return to. I wonder if we should do, or have we considered doing some sort of evaluation to get actual feedback from the users about what the issues are around these platforms. And then once we get that information, convening some group to see what we might be able to do to improve the situation because there, there's something that's not working as well as it should be. We certainly can do the evaluate. I'm sorry, Dr. Smith. Were you Go ahead. That's sorry. what I was going to say. I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. I, I was going to say we will definitely certainly do the evaluation. Um, in, in selecting a canvas for the fall, we did the evaluation then, but we do need to evaluate and see how well things are working and decide uh, if we need to make another change, right? So we definitely will do the evaluation. When, when should we look for that? I mean, what when would you be doing that? Can, can I interject there just for a second? So at the last board meeting, Mr. Turner shared the uh, process of how we will be collecting data from our staff, our students, and our parent community as we implement the online learning platform. A part of we were we, we've had divided into all of this is focusing on what information we need to collect from the staff so that's def, i believe that's one area we already had in there in terms of how are they utilizing and, and how well they're working with the platforms that we have so that that would indicate to us future training considerations um so we i'm sure we had that listed in there we will go back and check but that uh mr turner do you have the actual a schedule that you can look at so that Ms. Wolf will know when we're administering that staff survey from the timeline we presented at the last meeting. Sure. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. And yes, we are currently uh, have the staff survey open that has technology questions to really get feedback on what's working and what's not. One of the things I, I think it's important to know is that with all technology, and you know, what? I'm not able to hear you. I don't know whether you're too far away. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I, okay. can hear you I, I, I apologize. So um, yes, the staff survey uh, is live right now and people pr are providing feedback on the technology um, and what's working and what's not. And I think what's important is that with all new things, it's going to take a learning curve to, to get everything to work, where the buttons are, and making sure that what we're seeing with the challenges aren't related to just getting to know the technology on our really potentially problems with the, the actual systems working together. So that's why this survey is so important and, and having multiple longitudinal surveys to see where there can be growth as people have more and more time using the the software and the technology it's it's like switching from a pc to a mac people have a hard time transitioning it's hard but once you get it you get it and we're hoping to see that as time goes on 
You know, and, and I know we only get to ask one question. It's kind of with all due respect, it seems to me that it's, it's a little bit deeper problem than that. Um, and I'm not sure that you're going to get it through the evaluation document you have out on the, on the street kind of right now. Plus, I have seen some really good suggestions come in via email from, I think there's some of our teachers about things that we might want to take a look at. I'd like to forward those to you in case you haven't gotten them because I think these are people that you might, who, who really know computers and, and uh, you know, it's not like me that can barely get on Zoom. It might be able to provide some valuable input. input. Yes, Ms. Wolf, if you could send that to me, um, I will be happy to take that because one focus as we go through and collect feedback from our teachers in implementation of virtual environment is we know we're not going to get everything through a survey data, as you said. That's exactly right. Some people won't find that that the most meaningful way to uh, share their feedback. So we also have the technology deliverable team who we will continue to work with in which we expanded and will continue to expand to include our teachers to actually come together and sit and talk with us about what some of these complexities are so that we can get uh, feedback and, and recommendations from them. So we will, if you send that to me, we will take that into consideration as uh, in terms of our future planning and we will continue to engage beyond that survey by bringing that uh, group of teachers and other staff in to talk about the very thing that you're explaining. And I did wanna point out, it reminds me of a conversation we had over the summer and leading into this year. One of the complexities of why we went to one platform as well was in the spring, we got overwhelming data from our parents and others sharing that using multiple platforms was very difficult because you had to navigate getting into one and there are certain things that you're unable to do in Google Classroom that you are able to do in Canvas. And so the attempt there was to put it into all one space to make it more accessible and easy for people. However, with that said, as we implement this, we're gonna learn about what's working, what's not, and tweak what we can. Um, so we, we're gonna definitely do that. And I appreciate you sharing that with us, Ms. Wolf, and sending that feedback to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, um, I had a couple op organizational operational questions. Mr. Neff referenced uh, getting appropriate uh, PPE for folks who are going out into the community. And we have SEIU people every day in and day out interfacing with community members in the schools. And with an eye toward any kind of reopening or possible small groups or whatever, the question has come up about our ability to provide PPE, hand sanitizer for our schools, our staff, et cetera. So, if you're not prepared today, could we have an update on that? I, I saw Dr. Smith. I didn't know whether you were getting ready to respond. No. Okay. We well, can come back another time and respond about it. But just generally, what is our state of readiness with PPE? The other thing is election day is coming and uh, our high schools are going to be voting centers in Montgomery County. What is the impact on us? Uh, you can provide that update later. Mm -hmm. And and then a general observation about vaccinations uh, centers. Uh, I know that one in the 70s, when there was a potential for a large swine flu epidemic here in the county, the high schools were used as vaccination centers for swine flu. I went to Walter Johnson with my husband to get that vaccination in the cafeteria at Walter Johnson. And as a child, when polio was the scourge of society and the Sabine oral vaccine came out on the sugar cubes, I have a picture in my mind of going with my mother and my sister to our neighborhood high school in California to receive that vaccination. Have we been in conversations with the county health officials about our potential as vaccination sites because that would certainly impact our operations and our ability to open if our buildings are utilized as vaccination sites. 
Yes. So I'll just tell you generally, and then we'll send it to you specifically, and we'll also post it on board docs with this presentation, so it'll all be there. We've been spending literally millions of dollars on PPE, and we're continuing to buy uh, what we can get and supply it to our uh, staff members who are currently working out in uh, the community. And so we, we have been doing that, and we'll send that specifically to you. And um, the, we've been working with the Board of Elections, and we'll send that information to you on the requirements and the way we have to uh, interface with uh, voting sites, and there's been a lot of work done on that. And I'll defer to Dr. McKnight about the question about vaccination centers. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So, yes, we have uh, been collaborating with the Department of Health and Human Services and all of our county partners. We actually meet every other week just to discuss these very things. Um, we've, we were already even uh, faced sometimes with challenges of how do we identify sites for testing when we're using sites for food service and other things and we have to take all the things into consideration of how many people are in these spaces working, so on and so forth. Uh, we, we have already started the conversation about when a vaccination for COVID-19 is found. There is an expectation that uh, quite frankly, because there will be such a wide, uh, a, a wide need to be able to have vaccination centers that the school system will be utilized um, in, in a way to support that. So we take that into consideration as well, because that also speaks to the timing of everything that we're doing when that vaccination uh, is, is found, knowing that we will be expected to support, um, provide support as centers to the county. So that's where we are and we will continue to be in contact with them, as I said, every other week, just to think about how all of this lines up with timing, locations, and all of those uh, priorities. Ms. Evans? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, if I may. I, I just wanted to um, back up for a second about what um, uh, Mr. Turner and uh, Dr. McKnight had said about the survey thing. And I appreciate that you're gonna, that you're doing that. Um, but some of the concerns that we had heard were that there were no questions at all about how the platforms like Synergy have been performing no questions about the training um, in reference to, or and no, um, nowhere to ask about the Chromebooks, or um, and there was no place for comments. So I, I mentioned this in the beginning of the meeting, but I hadn't seen the survey myself. But I think it's going to be important that you put some of those questions on there, if that's the feedback we're trying to get, uh, particularly an area where they can just put comments. Absolutely. You, I'll let Mr. Turner you. speak to the survey specifically. Um, but one thing I will say is, as we talked about this first round of surveys, we you know went through, shared our survey with a number of different stakeholder groups. Um, staff included, community members included a number of, of groups to give us feedback on the things that we asked for that very question. We know we have a wide variety of, of uh, stakeholders who want to participate in it, and we want the questions to be meaningful. Um, and I'll let Mr. Turner address that, but the, I'll, I'll again elevate the importance of the technology advisory team that we have uh, that Mr. Chavanini and his staff have brought together and will continue to build on because a big part of what we will do is have to engage in discussion way beyond what the survey will be able to provide us. If we talk about the survey, much of the feedback we've gotten from community and, and, and uh, those who will take the survey is we've with the fight for time, we wanted to make sure it is consistent, it's clear, it's to the point, um, and we want to honor that, but at the same time knowing nothing's going to replace a discussion when we're sitting now virtually <laughs> and talking about, you know, what's working and what's not working in this platform. But um, Mr. Turner, any other comments about the survey specifically? Because this was our first round, but we definitely will take into consideration, Ms. Mondrowski, some of the things that you're bringing up here as it could inform some of the questions we'll ask our advisory team uh, to bring forward and discuss, as well as any adjustments we want to make in the future. Mr. Turner? Dr. Manette, you couldn't have said it better. That, that is uh, our goal is to have a streamlined survey asking um, uh, a broad uh, but, but um, a meaningful set of questions to get uh, feedback on how we're moving the needle. What we do have is a second open uh, feedback form called at mcpssubmitfeedback.org. And we've received over 15,000 responses from community members because we want them to be res respond in real time about things that they're challenged with, things they're concerned about. And so they don't have to wait until the survey to give us those details, but we can take that information in real time, adjust the, the, the things that can be adjusted, respond to the things 
that need to be responded to and really um, make the uh, changes um, so that the next survey comes out reflects their experience after those changes have been made. Thank you. Dr. Daka. Oh, no, thank you. I don't have any questions. Very good. Ms. Silvestri. No? Yes? Okay. Yes, um, I wanted to uh, echo my colleagues' concerns about getting teachers the support that they need, and it sounds like there's a plan to do that. But um, uh, the more support that they can get, the faster the learning curve will be achieved and um, people can be in a better place. I just wanted to say, um, I think what's been said also is just this is really hard. Uh, it's hard for parents. It's hard for teachers. I'm sure it's hard for you all as well. And, um, um, you know, we are doing the best that we can and we are going to get better. Uh, but just wanted to um, just recognize that it, this is not easy. Like Dr. Smith said, nobody wanted wanted to be doing it this way. But um, I just want to recognize that. And my question is about uh, Mr. Naff, you mentioned the, um, the need for more data gathering um, in your uh, work with figuring out what's happening at the school level. Can you explain about that? What, why is that needed? How What's the desired goal and what will that do? Sure. So the student well-being teams will be asked to collect data on the students that are being referred. So it'll be the demographic data, grade level, other demographics, um, what the nature of the concern was. Is it a social emotional issue, issue? Is it an attendance or engagement issue? Is it a family needing resources issue? And then what the follow-up was, um, connection to resources, home visits, you know, something along those lines. And then so each school will be able to individually look at this is the student population that appears to be struggling the most. These are the things that they are struggling the most with. This is what we've done so far to address that. Um, are there other ideas that we can access from the school system, from community partners, or from other places so that we can be responsive to what our individual school data says are the unique needs of our students and community. Thank you, Mr. Asante. Uh, yeah, um, I want to first off, but start off by saying like all the data presented in this presentation, it was really great to see with the large amount of um, home visits and then also seeing the downward trend of people who aren't logging in. Although I know we have received some emails from teachers who are Say, um, have said that students are logging in, but they're leaving their cameras off and they're not engaged. And I'm not exactly sure um, how to fix that, but I think that's something to look into. My question though is sort of comes from the public comments um, and it's about material distribution. Uh, someone mentioned that the workbooks weren't uh, distributed universally, uh, but and, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on that because I thought that every student received uh, a workbook, like every elementary school student. Um, so I, I can, um, absolutely. And I, um, so we'd be happy to understand if there is a specific um, need that's outstanding. And I see um, Ms. Hazel has come on. She may be able to have some more information as well. But I can tell you that we are um, absolutely continuing those distributions as well. And we do have um, ongoing distributions. So if there was a uh, situation where perhaps there was a delivery that was out of sync, we can absolutely catch up with that and we will catch up with that and be sure that everyone has the materials that they need. Some of it was that we were distributing them again sort of in, in different phases um, as they were coming up um, with the instructional content. And again, uh, I'll pass it off to my colleague there to speak a little bit more specifically about those workbooks. But I do just wanna assure everyone that the distributions are ongoing and we will continue that process. Yes, and just to add to that, you know, we made the decision um, that we would go from a three-year curriculum rollout to a two-year. And uh, we are working with four different vendors. Uh, and so it was a huge lift on their part to get all of the materials that they weren't expecting to have ready and sent to schools. Um, and so unfortunately for a few schools, what happened was that um, the vendors sent directly to schools, not through our warehouse. Um, and because the schools were closed this summer, some um, were not there to receive it. And then they sent it back to the vendor. So we had to, it, it, 
there were a couple of schools where we um, just needed to make sure everybody was connected and materials were received, but it did put a couple of schools behind um, in the distribution. But I think we're all good now and, and we're uh, connecting with schools regularly just to make sure that everybody has what they need. And this I'll add to, if, if I could add just to that, that connection, and that was one of the conversations that we as directors had uh, even with our schools today was about this uh, topic exactly to make sure they had all the materials that they needed. Uh, and if they did not, you know, what was the process of how we could support to get that out to them. So it is a constant conversation that we're having with schools to make sure if they need help from op the operations side or they need help from the, uh, the curriculum side that we're, we're in tune with that and making sure that they get exactly what they need as soon as possible. Yes, and Ms. Evans, if I may just add one other um, item, um, Ms. McGuire's operations and transportation um, have been great in actually even running a route where needed to get materials out. So the principals know that once materials come in or if there's a distribution and it's, it's a situation where we're not reaching all the families, all they have to do is call operations and uh, Todd will stand ready to run a route and uh, they will communicate out to the families where the materials need to go. And the principals certainly do and are aware that they're able to do that. Thank you for Thank that. You. Okay, Ms. Dixon. Oops, have to unmute myself. So thank you all for the presentation. Um, uh, I'm not sure which of these questions to ask uh, first, but um, I was just curious with the, uh, by the numbers enrollment with code um, 24, we saw that um, we had 51 withdrawals last year to homeschooling and 984 uh, this year to homeschooling. So should we conclude that those were families that didn't want to do the virtual learning. Um, uh, what, what's the thinking about that? Do we know I anything? Certainly, I certainly would draw that conclusion. And we okay. actually, in, in the spring, uh, many families said, we're going to go to homeschooling, but we don't want you to withdraw our children. Just send us the materials and we'll mm -hmm. make our decision up later. And so Dr. Wilson and all of the associates and directors just worked with families to keep a record of that because many of them in the spring said, there's no way this is ever going to work for us right now. Give us all the materials and we'll homeschool our kids because we're not gonna be able to get online. And I think now they're making it more permanent. My hope is that they come back to us when uh, we're not in an all virtual environment. But uh, that's exactly where my mind went when I read that number. That's why we, we wanted to share it with you today. Okay. And um, the other thing that I wanted to share was um, at least, you know, it's clear to me in terms of uh, all of the hundreds of emails that we've been receiving. Um, and I'm thinking specifically, uh, you know, of uh, the teachers and, you know, even from their spouses who talk about, um, you know, how many hours uh, they are working over uh, time, um, uh, you know, to, to make this work. And um, one of the things that uh, has been really clear is that the Wednesdays that we set aside for uh, teaching planning, teacher planning, are really being consumed uh, by other things, including uh, training, uh, you know, uh, responding, I guess, to emails, um, and that, you know, they really are not getting the full use of that time that has been supposedly put aside for them to be able to do some planning. And so I'm not sure that we need a survey, uh, you know, to tell us that, uh, although, uh, you know, there wasn't a place on the survey that was put out for teacher comments. But I mean, that's been clear in the uh, emails that have come to the Board of Education. So I'm wondering uh, whether we're going to have any adjustments uh, or 
looking into uh, you know the use of teacher time, I did see too that um, two of the candidates who would like to uh, replace me had a meeting with students and um, uh, one of the students, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, my colleagues, but one of this, this came, I think, in the uh, notes uh, that we get, you know, the news reports, but um, the students were saying uh, that they really um, appreciated the time on Wednesdays to be able to regroup, uh, to be off uh, Zoom, and uh, you know to be able to work on their own. So I'm hoping that you know we will have uh, some adjustment or easing up of um, all of the things that we're asking uh, teachers to do, which is really eating up that time that was set aside for the planning on Wednesdays. Um, and then I, I just thought uh, for uh, Mr. Shevnini that uh, you know you gave us the device up update, but I didn't see. I know we have done this uh, that we have provided some laptops. Um, do we have a number on the total laptops that we've provided other than staff Chromebooks? There, there isn't. Uh, I don't have the number of the laptops as of yet. I know we are still giving those out to uh, different groups, and I know we are still expecting a huge shipment to come in at the beginning of October for our special education teachers. Um, the problem is there's such a global shortage that uh, we're pulling whatever strings we can to make sure that deliveries are met on time, which is proven to be very, very difficult. However, right now we're still in good shape for getting those devices on time. Okay, so Pete, when you get that information, uh, that would really be good because the other thing that is really clear, um, you know, from uh, the emails that we're getting as board members um, is, uh, you know, that the Chromebooks are not, uh, the staff Chromebooks are not all that, uh, they feel is uh, useful in terms of delivering the instructional program. So I'm really um, happy that, uh, you know, we are making some efforts to get these uh, Chromebooks. So uh, I guess that question, and I'll direct that to uh, Dr. McKnight, just about the Wednesdays. What, what are we, are we going to give any relief, uh, you know, just in terms of the teachers having that time, giving, given that they're spending so much time uh, outside of, uh, you know, their work day, preparing lessons and um, that sort of thing? Or are we just going to go full steam ahead, you know? No. And, you know, just ignore that, what, what they're telling us about, you know, the time on Wednesdays. No, thank you, Ms. Dixon. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, we've had so many discussions about, you know, what's going to work best for our teachers, which will in turn work best for our kids. And I think one of the themes that we continue to come back to today in this board meeting is how do we meet the, the middle ground in terms of what is required by uh, the state and making sure we're meeting those standards and then what we're able to, to do uh, here in this space. And so to this point, we've been able to meet the requirement by the state for the number of hours that we have to have available for our students in uh, synchronous and asynchronous instruction. Um, but in terms of your question around how one, we're protecting uh, the time or looking at the use of teacher time on Wednesday, uh, Dr. Wilson and her team, a big part of what they're doing is watching the or, or supporting the implementation of this virtual format to ensure that all of the things that we took into consideration in terms of the schedule, what needs to be done, is playing out in a way that meets the needs of the schools because that's why we also provided schools some flexibility in terms of how they use that time based on traditions that they had around how teachers would collaborate, connect and whatever it is. And so they're gonna to continue to work with all of our principals and others to ensure that those, those things that we found successful for our teachers and how they work together for our students are protected within the guidelines of uh, the number of hours that we have to provide for our students given by the state. But as you said, Ms. Dixon, we're, we're never just gonna go full steam ahead 
and not think about what our teachers are providing us along the way in this because we'll have to take their feedback and look at it and say, what does this mean for the levels of flexibility that we do have and make adjustments um, accordingly? So I, I did want to share that. Dr. Smith? I was just going to say, interestingly enough, the, uh, during this meeting, I've been receiving the updates from the state board meeting today, and there's a PowerPoint that I forwarded to Sandy Napoli and ask her to put it in the transmittal for tomorrow. And it shows every school system in the state a lot of information about each of us. So it will give uh, all of our board members and all of our uh, uh, staff some sense of the range of what's happening around the state in terms of synchronous hours, asynchronous hours, and hours per week of uh, direct instruction, all those sorts of things. Because it is within the context of the state of Maryland because it goes back to Ms. O'Neill's point about $700 million. And, and so we're living within those, those guidelines is critically important because we don't want to give anyone any justification to not fund us to the greatest degree possible as we face what many are saying is double or triple the, the Great Recession's economic negative impact on our future funding. And all that has to stay in the context of you know, where we are right now. So that it'll be worth looking at. It's really an interesting report that they put out today. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, but back to my point about the uh, use of that time, I think that, you know, the teachers say they love their students and, and we know that they, they do. But um, I, I think most teachers don't write to Board of Education members unless they're... Uh, you know, at their breaking point. And uh, I, I think what we don't want to have is, you know, um, breakdowns in terms of, you know, uh, mental, uh, emotional, uh, because this is so overwhelming. And we did say, and, you know, Dr. McKnight, you did say we needed to be nimble and we need to, you know, keep our finger on the pulse of, you know, how all of that is going with them. Um, because, you know, at a certain point, I think you can't get more out of people. And um, I think we really do need to be sensitive to that. So that's all I would, you know, share with you. And, and also with the survey, I think it might be also useful to survey the students at the secondary level. Um, because I found the comments uh, that the students were making that they were sharing um, with the two candidates, uh, uh, Lynn Harris and Sunil uh, Dasgupta, about um, you know how the Wednesdays worked and how this all was working. It would be useful to hear from them, uh, you know, as well. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. And just to let you know, we are definitely going to continue to hear from our students as well. Um, they are a part of that cycle of feedback that we're collecting from community members, staff, and then as, as our students. We will have to see how all of that uh, connects, disconnects, so that we can then think about what the implications are for us. But I appreciate you raising that as always. And we appreciate our teachers and, and also just know that this is it's difficult. And so I appreciate them writing us and sharing us because we can take all of that into consideration as we plan moving forward. And like I said, as Dr. Wilson, her team works with each of the schools to ensure that, you know, we're, we're making adjustments when and how best needed to support our staff who then supports our support our students. Thank you. May I just add in that we are actually surveying students and uh, we got great feedback from Mr. Sante about the question. So we are asking both our students, staff and families their experience, uh, including questions about Wednesdays uh, from both the staff perspective and the family perspective so that we understand the, the full scope of how every participant is experiencing it. Right. And please give them a section for their written comments. Uh, you know, surveys can be written to, you know, get what information we want, but to have people actually be able to share uh, what they're thinking and what they're going through, I think is very useful uh, to have. Okay, thank you. And um, we appreciate once again, having the update on the recovery of education. At this time, we're moving to item eight, consent um, item. Oh. Ms. Ms. Evans, I'm sorry, but I, I just have two more little quick things, but they're like little quick things. Um, one is 
um, well, Ms. Uh, we heard that the special education technology is still coming, so that's done. Um, who's uh, I, my one question is who's at the buildings like so um, in the offices, for example, answering phones or watching when someone's at the front door? Do we have people there? Yes. Just a quick, uh, quick answer. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Dr. McKnight. Yes, we're saying. Okay. Yes. <laughs> We okay. do. We have staff rotated to cover all those things that we knew would be important as we started the school year, answering phones. We've actually been uh, have a security designated, knowing that their roles are different now to all of our elementary schools to support distribution, all of those things. Okay, great. Um, and um, and then the last thing was just um, as we just as a consideration, taking a look. You don't need to comment on it. Just putting it up there taking a look at whether or not we should be doing half day kindergarten um, morning afternoon type thing where parents can sign into both if they want to, or it's or the curriculum's crammed into, whether it's just for kindergarten or kindergarten and first grade, I don't know, but just to address some of the issues that we've heard. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll move to item eight consent items. If I can get a motion to pull them, I mean, to, um, to vote them in block. Um. I'd like to move items 8.18. Move them in block. Second. The mood is seconded. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. The next item is um, item 9, Board of Education items. Um, can I get a motion to move items 9.1 and 9.2 in block? Um, move items 9.1 and 9.2 in block. Second. Been moved and second by a show of hands, all in favor. And again, that is unanimous, thank you. So we're at 9.3. Are there any new business items that board members would like to bring forward? I'd, bring forward yeah. um, so I'd like to bring forward a resolution related to mental health days, which I know mental health is an issue that a lot of students care about and it's something that's always been at the forefront, but I think now more so than ever, it's something that's a big concern for a lot of students. So I wanted to bring forward this resolution to sort of look into the process of uh, making mental health days count as uh, an excuse absence for students. And so the resolution reads, uh, whereas the Code of Maryland Regulations, Section 13A, 080103 establishes the conditions under which students may be lawfully absent from school. And whereas Montgomery County Public Schools MCPS regulation GEARA -E student attendance establishes the permissible reasons for excused absences in accordance with the law. And whereas the MCPS Be Well 365 initiative is intended to support the overall, overall well being of the district students, including the management of stress and anxiety. And whereas the Board of Education recognizes that MCPS students are facing daily competing demands and stress that have been particularly heightened for many students during the COVID 19 pandemic. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Education requests the Policy Management Committee to review all relevant board policies and MCPS regulations and explore the possibilities and impact of explicitly permitting excuse mental health days and be further resolved, the Board of Education P Policy Management Committee should make recommendations to the full board no later than January, 2021. I'll give that a second. You're on mute, Shepra. Okay. Um, has been moved and seconded. Was there any discussion, comments? I just want to clarify this is just to look at it, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, Ms. Wolf. Um, I, I find this a very interesting resolution because it seems to me that there's already a mechanism in place for having an excused absence if the parent wants to approve it. And that is just that they say that the child is ill. Right. Uh, and it just, you know, I, I don't mean to be insulting in any way, shape or form, but it seems like busy work for the policy committee because you can, as a parent, I can write in and say this already. I also have to wonder if the disability community will take exception to students having to identify mental illness as a reason for being out ill. That's my two cents worth. Thank you. It's an interesting question. 
Uh, so I just I want to say that um, with with the current method, I mean, some students will take mental health days off and count it as a sickness. But I think a, having it as a policy is sort of a statement piece and I think would mean a lot to a lot of students to have that option of saying you're taking a day off to prioritize your mental health and to de-stress and things like that. And I think it's more more it's not necessarily related to like um, diagnosed mental illness, but rather students um, self-care and, you know, prioritizing the uh, state of their mental health. This is O'Neill. Yeah, not to be cheeky, but, you know, I have to say at various times, uh, through this COVID crisis, I've had to take a mental health day and not look at emails uh, because I would be very depressed or stressed. Um, but I, I don't have an objection to the policy management committee looking at it. You know, we really, what is in Comar really drives what is permissible for us to do it. We can take another look at Comar. I mean, we left the issue about policy KEA and uh, excused absences for civic engagement uh, as part of, you know, un unresolved. But, you know, some of it, it, it is all driven really by what is in Comar. So I don't have a problem in taking a look at this. Um, but, and, and I do believe all of us at some point, you know, have times that we may take a mental health, but, you know, attendance is very much uh, a regulatory driven issue other than if, as, Ms. Wolf may have suggested that some parents, you know, would might write a note and say their child is not well. Ms. Dixon. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I agree with uh, Pat that uh, it would be uh, a good idea to take a look at it. Uh, you know, the attendance, the absences have codes. And so, uh, you know, um, and, and I do think that, you know, everything has just changed in the country uh, with this pandemic. And um, uh, I, I do think that, you know, having these mental health days don't necessarily mean that you have, as Nick said, you know, a mental illness, but it's a time that you need for yourself to decompress. And, um, you know, I just... Uh, uh, returned in August from a trip to Greenville, South Carolina, to my mother's house. And I actually went alone. And it was great being there alone uh, by myself. It was like my vacation this year. Um, so, um, I, and I, I, I think it would be a good idea uh, to go forth and just take a look at this and and see, and you know, and we can get more input from students. The policy committee can get more input from students as well. And, you know, and it might be something that would be interested in allowing us to keep our finger on the pulse of, uh, you know, how our students are feeling, uh, you know, uh, just about all of the things that they go through. And um, so, uh, um, I'll, I'll be prepared to support that, uh, you guys taking a look at that. Ms. Um, Silvestre. I missed the, uh, the time frame. When it, what does the resolution say? Uh, by G a recommendation by January. And does that fit within the policy committee's work plan? I, 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 I have to say, uh, that's the only thing that gives me real pause on this. I, I think uh, I would, it would, I would feel more comfortable if it said winter 2021, because the policy management committee, we have a pretty full agenda. Uh, we have an October 22nd meeting. We typically, I think there's one meeting in December. We don't, I think there's not a meeting in November. I think the January 21, uh, deadline might be tight. I think it should just say winter 2021. If I could offer that as an amendment. I'll, I'll take that amendment to make it say winter 2021. Um, right. Um, 
how, how much work is that for staff? Because we did say we would be mindful during um, the emergency situation of um, what additional work we would add on to it. So, well, hopefully, opening up the date helps. All right, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor of supporting um, going to the policy committee for a look. Show of hands. Okay. So that is um, everyone with the exception of Mrs. Wolf. All right, so at this time we are moving on to item 10, which is informational purposes only. If I can get a motion to adjourn. You're on mute. That's how we know it's late. Yeah, we definitely want to be heard. <laughs> <laughs> Move adjournment. Second. It's been moved and seconded all in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Have a good rest of the week and we will um, see you all later. Thank you for joining us for this virtual board business meeting. Take care, everybody.